Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign. Live Marker Podcast presents Fundraiser 7. Deader. Welcome again to the Clyde Barker Podcast. This is episode 274, AZ Commentaries. So we're going to be discussing uh, Alien uh, from 1979, a uh, movie directed by Ridley Scott, as featured in the chapter F is for Flesh of Clive Barker's A through Z of Horror. And uh, today uh, I'm joined by uh, Ryan. Hello. And Ed Martinez. Hello. And Nina as well. Hi. So we're watching today, which cut is it? The director's cut, right? Yeah, the 2003 director's cut. In space, no one can hear you scream. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, (laughs) space truckers uh, make a pit stop, get a bad egg sandwich, and they get parasites. (laughs) (laughs) Or a B-movie haunted house in space. You know the drill. We're going to do the commentary track, so set up your movie, set up the Alien film to the 20th Century Fox logo. By the way, did you guys hear what happened to the 20th Century Fox logo now since Disney bought it? No. So they've changed the name. Now it's no longer 20th Century Fox. It's going to be 20th Century Television. Seriously? Yeah, even, people even are going up on, in arms about it. Even on movies? Yeah, huh. I think so. Yeah, the, the Disney decided to change, so it's no longer going to be called 20th Century Fox after the. I mean, I could see calling it 21st Century, maybe, but <laughs> yeah, so, I know. That's... So if you go on like Disney Plus and you watch Star Wars, is it going to say 20th Century Television on it instead of Fox? No, I think it's just from now on. New oh, stuff okay. Well, I guess that that's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I guess it's more cosmetic, right? I mean, the yeah. big differences that Disney's going to do are probably already done. Uh, to 20th Century Fox yeah. since they bought it. But anyway, so get your movie all the way up to the beginning of the 20th Century Fox logo, and uh, we'll do a quick countdown, 3, 2, 1, and then hit play, and we'll be able to watch the movie together. And also, there will be spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film, it's already 40-something years old, 41 years old. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit late if you don't <laughs> yeah. know the ending. <laughs> It's a, it's it's a spawned party. a whole franchise of movies. Oh God, yeah! Like yeah. how many? Like it, it almost, almost. And uh, the AV three franchises. franchises. Yeah, yeah. The, so there's two of the Predator. Alien versus Predators. There's there's these four of these Alien movies, and then two there's more the of the, the Prometheus ones. And all the comic books and novels. So that's, and video games. Yeah. So and, that's eight movies. Wow. Yeah, tons, tons of growing. comic books and stuff. Yeah. All right, so I'll do the countdown today, if that's okay. okay. So get your finger in the button, and we're going to play it in All three, ready. two, one, play. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Old Century Fox logo. Yeah. Every time I see this old-fashioned one, I feel like I'm about to watch a Star Wars movie. Yeah, it's it's funny, too, seeing it with the, the, the fanfare music in mono. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> Also, I just want to let everybody know that I'm a blind podcaster, so I am so familiar with this film, I don't even need to see it. (laughs) The the theater of the mind. (laughs) Right. I can confirm that. (laughs) I think I'm probably the only blind podcaster out there that does movies. (laughs) That may be. Sigourney Weaver, uh, one of my early crushes. Uh, yeah. Probably from watching Alien because I think it was one of the first movies she did, right? Yes, it is her first film, actually. Yep. Before that, it was stage. Oh, that's right. A lot of people came from theater into this movie, like uh, Yefet Koto and John Hurt, uh, yeah. Sigourney Weaver, Ian Holm was probably the bigger theater star at the moment. Oh, R.I.P. All of them, though, had made lots of movies. Yeah. You know, she was not a movie person. Yeah. So I love this uh, alien logo 
the way they, yeah. they start yes. out with these little strips of white and then yeah. they just start. Like hieroglyphics. And it's yeah. a good preview of the way the movie works, right? Is it that the, the, the alien is so gradually introduced to us? Yeah. Yes. Screenplay yeah, it's like an archaeological Dan excavation. Yeah. So funny story about Dan O'Bannon's story and how he came to make the movie, right? So he had he was friends in uh, in film school with uh, Carpenter, and they wrote together and made a movie called Dark Star, which was kind of a space comedy kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Where the alien lots of special effects, spaceships, space suits, al yeah. an alien, a beach ball alien. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, such a such a big production at one point that they were like, let's get a distribution. And then they realized, oh, instead of making a really impressive student film, we actually made a kind of a mediocre <laughs> space comedy film. <laughs> well, it was a short to begin with. And in order to make it into a feature, they actually had the production company that you know wanted to buy it and stuff, give them a little bit more money, and they had to pad it out with some more footage and stuff. Like, I believe that beach ball thing and all that was not in the original. So um, that's part of the padding it out and stuff. But funny thing about length. the Nostromo prop, uh, it was found out decades later in a pretty bad shape, um, and it was uh, restored and uh, by the prop store. And uh, they actually, when they found it, it had uh, some inhabitants in there, not aliens. Well, actually, but the story is it's Bob Burns' property. Bob Burns was given the Nostromo and uh, the original alien, the facehugger, like tons of stuff for his Hollywood Halloween event that he did every year. And the year that he did Alien, the studio, 20th Century Fox, brought him a truck, a giant diesel truck, like a semi-truck, to his neighborhood, to his house with a, a forklift. And they unloaded that thing. That thing had a steel structure inside side of it and it was like 12 feet long by 15 wow. feet wide by 10 feet tall and they just put it in his yard he couldn't put it indoors anywhere and so he just threw a blue tarp over it and for the past like 25 years it was outdoors and that's why raccoons and <laughs> things like that were living in it and you know it'd been getting rained on and stuff and the guys from the prop store of london in the la office they were friends with bob burns and they allowed you know bob burns allowed them to take it and put it in a warehouse house where a professional model building crew restored it and now it's beautiful it looks exactly like it did when they were filming it originally that's wonderful yeah they found a couple of dead opossums in there oh, yeah. <laughs> well it had been out in his backyard for 25 years or something <laughs> you know i call the big one bitey <laughs> right. I mean, that story about Bob Burns, he's the guy, you know, that he has this helmet that you're seeing right now yeah. with the lights reflecting on it. Yeah. He has that helmet. The the uh, the box that Jones is in later, yeah. he's got that box. Man, the, poor the, Jones. And the alien, like, hits it and knocks it around. <laughs> um, but, I mean, all these artifacts, the original movies, artifacts, Bob Burns owns them now. They're in his yeah. collection. The original facehugger, the original chestburster, the original egg, you know, the original head, you know, he's got them all. <laughs> so, so, Ed, you, you saw this in the theater when it came out? Oh, yeah, on day one. Wow. I was the kind of guy that I was aware that this movie was being made. You know, Ma Heavy Metal Magazine, I was a reader of that, and I was buying all the issues month by month, and there was, month by month, there was an issue that came out that said this movie was being made. Then another month came out, and it started showing photos from it and stuff. And so, I was ready when I knew that this was going to be at the theater, just like Star Wars. I was at yeah. the theater on day one in line of Star Wars also. I, I saw it the, in the first couple of weeks in the theater, but not opening night. I went to Dollar Night. Oh, wow. <laughs> Leisure Land Cinema, old. Dollar Night on Mondays. Yeah. I saw yeah, it at the North I, Point I was, I was only five. You know, and honestly, I saw... My parents didn't let me see R-rated movies, so I saw Aliens on TV first before I ever saw Alien. And my dad told me, oh, no, it's too scary. You don't want to see that because he had read the novelization and he described the the scene where Dallas is, is cocooned, the on, yeah, is cocooned yeah. on the on the wall and they had to, and she used the flamethrower on him and he's going, kill me. He's like, oh, that's too scary. You shouldn't watch that movie. But find out later <laughs> it wasn't even... That it wasn't in. wasn't even in. Movie. Yeah, he didn't know it wasn't <laughs> even in the movie until like 2003. 
right. Alan Dean Foster wrote the novelization. Wrote, wrote the novelization. He, he wrote a lot most of, of all of the other novelizations as well, like Alien Two, Alien Three, Alien Four. You know, uh, he wrote all of them. Well, and I didn't know at the time when my dad was telling me that that the novel was based on the movie. I thought it was the other way around. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, he gets given the script, and he has to write the novel while the movie is in production. And at this particular time, they didn't give him nothing. He didn't get no photographs. He yeah. didn't get to see what the alien looked like, what the face hugger looked like, nothing. Well, that Just was the script. It was smart of them on the production to hide the alien, you know, until the movie. Absolutely. Out. Yeah. And, and I, I love the, the, uh, the, this movie feels so real, even though there's like 70s computers in it. But it still it still feels so real, and and a lot of it is the the actors, you know, and just watching them wake up out of hypersleep. It's like, yeah, that is probably what it would be like, right? I mean, you would be so sluggish, and it would take you forever to get up. And all these people are uh, they're still groggy, even though they're now they're sitting around at breakfast. Right, and that's the first meal they've eaten in how long? Yeah, probably you know? like months. Years could be. Yeah. I mean, you know, traveling in space, you know, yeah. even at light speed, you know, to go from a, one star system to another could literally yeah. take years. Probably not as long because I remember that in one of the sequels, Sigourney Weaver does have a daughter, right? Yeah. So I would imagine right. that probably months, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't see someone with a daughter being able to go to space for years and years on end. Um, well, maybe not this particular mission, but I just mean that. It it is vast distances we're yeah. talking, you know. Course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know it's a MacGuffin as far as like how long it takes to get through. Like you know, hyperspace doesn't exist in real life, or right. So this but, this um, set was enormous. It was actually all these rooms were connected and yeah. um, hallways and all that stuff. So once you got into the set, there were no windows looking out, and. Um, yeah, it was pretty detailed. Uh, yeah. It's hard to imagine that they had like an eight million dollar budget, and when you see at the scale of the stuff that they constructed for this movie, it's it's pretty. Well, impressive. one of the great things about these sets was that they used aircraft, uh, you know, hardware. Like they went, they whatever money they did spend on stuff, you know, they went to like a an aircraft and electronics, you know, graveyard and bought like truckloads of stuff and then yeah. they brought that all back to the warehouse and you know over the years i am such a big alien fan i have Im imitated i have duplicated these sets on a smaller and lower budget of course um for many haunts over the years like right after this movie came out in the theater my yeah. friends and i we were working on alien full-size costume suits you know when nothing was available there was nothing commercially available no face huggers no masks nothing and we made it, you know, we made them. And then, you know, Bob Burns was doing his alien Hollywood Halloween down in Los Angeles with the original head and the original face hugger and all this stuff. And people like Walter Koenig, you know, Walter Koenig from Star Trek, classic Star Trek, you know, uh, Ensign Chekhov yeah. was a friend of Bob Burns. And he played in this Hollywood Halloween for Bob. He pretended to be, you know, like a member of the Nostromo crew. They had a hat, they had a jacket, you know, they said Nostromo and everything, all the patches and everything. Oh, wow. And they did a recreation of all the sets, you know, the tubes and the corridors and the hallways and the airlocks and everything. And they built an alien, a full size wearable costume, you know, from the neck down because they didn't have a costume that a normal sized person, you know, like Balaji Badejo is almost like seven feet tall and yeah. his arms almost reach his knees, you know, and he's, he's a tall, thin, skinny yeah. guy. Yeah. So even if they had that costume, nobody could fit into that. So they had to build one, but they used the original head and they built one, Bob and Dennis Skotak, who ended up working on the second movie for James Cameron, they built for Bob Burns a copy of the suit, you know, just using mattress foam and latex and, mm. you know, cardboard and foam and stuff. And they built it on like a jumpsuit, like Michael Myers wears, just a fabric jumpsuit. But it was kind of a stocky, stout alien that Bob Burns could actually fit into, you know, because he was a middle-aged he man. He's pretty big, yeah. Kind of yeah. a barrel body, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically mother has awakened them because they detected a signal in space. And so yeah. mother, the sh spaceship's computer is telling them that they got to go and investigate because the, the company, uh, is it Wayland Utani? Yeah. The company that, okay. Yeah. So you, the company, do you think that, um, that 
at any point in this time that Captain Dallas ever learned about the secret order? From or he just bought, never bothered to ask Mother about it. Well, no, I think he knew better computer. than to ask. It's like obviously when they put Ash on board, and you know he was not told shit, you know about anything. And, yeah, you know, well, like Sigourney Weaver was able hint. to override it and find out what the secret order was. Because once she, she the, was in the charge. Emergencies, once the emergencies were taking place, and she was the captain, essentially, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but Dallas never bothered to look into it, right? He's just like, well, science, that's Ash's department. Right. Yeah. Because that's his orders. You know, he was yeah. told, I'm sure, before they left, that Ash is in control because they knew that Ash was being sent to bring back the alien under no circumstances was anything else more important, you know? Yeah. Right, and so they, they this was going to happen all along. It wasn't just all of a sudden, hey, there's a signal. Cause they, no, it was cause a, the, they knew what they were doing. They yeah. sent them there, you know? Yeah. So a funny thing about the origin of the story, uh, when Dan O'Bannon decided that uh, after Dark Star he wanted to make a science fiction movie that would also have like a real alien and it would be more like a horror movie because he didn't like comedy that much. He was working with uh, Ronald uh, Shusset. Shushit. Shushit. Yeah. And uh, at one point, uh, the script was going to be called Star Beast. And uh, one of the original ideas was about gremlins infiltrating a B-17 bomber during World War II. Um, so I'm wow. so glad that we got this instead. <laughs> well, actually, he took that same story. He did write that story. That was used in Heavy Metal, the movie Heavy Metal, the short little oh, sequence yeah, of right. gremlins yeah. invading oh, yeah. the bomber. That uh-huh. was Dan O'Bannon's script for that. Oh, there you go. So it did end so up all his ideas usually end up somewhere in a movie. <laughs> he did re- Return of the Living Dead. He directed Return of the Living Dead. And apparently people didn't the really like Dan O'Bannon's script that much, right? They had it mostly rewritten. Um, they were snobs, I think. I mean, yeah. personally, I'm a Dan O'Bannon fan. I mean, I love Dark Star, and I love Return of the Living Dead, and I... I you know, think Dan O'Bannon is an unsung hero that, you know, they abused him. You know, like, did you hear the story about how during production, they locked him out of the screening room, wouldn't let him go and see dailies. So really? he just snuck oh. into the screening the projection, projection booth, booth. <laughs> and stood up in the projection booth with the projector and watched the dailies anyway. And he loved it. He thought it was just, really was doing a great job. Yeah. I, I uh, Walter Hill, I didn't like so there's the documentary for the making of the Alien movie. Um, what is it called? Let me see my notes here. It's called uh, uh, the, the Beast Within, The Making of Aliens. So they have an interview there with uh, several people like Dan O'Bannon, Ron Cobb, uh, the director, uh, Ridley Scott, and Walter Hill. And Walter Hill comes across being really, really snobbish, right? He's yes. like, yeah, I, I hated the script when I read it. David so. Geiler, Walter Hill, all three of them were snobs. Yeah, and then Dan O'Bannon is complaining, saying, one of the first things they did was they changed all the names of the, the characters in my script. And yeah. I was like... And like, as if that, that's going to make a difference. <laughs> yeah, like, he thought that because the Writers Guild, like, uh, regulations or something, that that would count as a, a substantial rewriting. It didn't work. It did not work. Yeah. Yeah, they, that's what their goal was. They were essentially going to try and screw him out of credit. You know, like by figuring a way of writing enough, in, insert enough into it that they would then be able to arbitrate it to, you know, Writers Guild and get full credit Jeez, for them. Here's the, so here's the beautiful Nostromo prop making its descent into the planet, yeah. LV-426, uh, the one that you said yeah. it was in Bob Burns. Collection. Bob Burns's possession collection. That stuff yeah. was just, they, they would just go into a kid's store and buy like 150 copies of like uh, a, a tank train or set a tra- or a tank. train or yeah. something yeah. like that. And yep. they would kit bash all that stuff on the surface, right? It's really yeah, like cool. all the guys that worked on all that stuff, you know, Brian Johnson from Space 1999, he was one of the guys that was hired to work on it. And then I think what happened was the Empire Strikes Back came along and he had to leave Alien to go work on that. But uh, one of the guys that's really well known, you know, Martin Bauer, who's a really excellent model builder, he built a lot of the stuff like, you know, the Sulaco, you know, the, the escape craft, you know, put a lot of time in on, you know, the, the big oil refinery thing. Oh, and you know the story about how Ridley didn't like the way that the oil refinery was looking, you know, the big part, not the Nostromo, not the ship where the people are in, but the big oil refinery parts with all the big domes underneath it, you know, yeah. half belly domes and these big spires. Yeah. He took a hammer and a chisel and went over to the big spires. He didn't like those spires. He thought they looked too much like cathedrals and stuff. And he just knocked them off with a hammer oh, and a chisel. 
<laughs> and here are these model builders that have been working on this for, I think it was, they said it was like 14 weeks or something oh, at that God. point. <laughs> he, I, they must have been so angry. No, it's their, you know, he's the boss, you know. Yeah. He knows, I mean, he was an art director. He was an artist in and of himself. Like, he loved heavy metal magazines so much. He was such a fan of Mobius, you know, um, the the artist, you know, the famous yeah. French artist, that he went, you know, and designed all the storyboards based on Mobius's work and based on all the artwork that he had been in love with from heavy metal. So when he storyboarded the storyboards, they looked so cool that the studio tripled the budget. It went from, I think initially it was $2 million, went to $8 million. Yeah. Really, Scott's storyboards are really good. I mean, he's really very talented as a, as a as an artist, artist unto as himself. Well. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it's funny that uh, some of the characters' uh, jobs here, so like Ripley, and I never really noticed this until I started looking more into the characters, she's like a warrant officer, um, right. Dallas, of course, played by Tom Skerritt, is the captain. You got the science officer Ash, who's the android. Um, Kane is Ash another is a goddamn robot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kane is a warrant officer. Uh, Lambert is a navigator of the Nostromo. So she, she's played by Veronica Cartwright. Uh, Parker is the chief engineer, yeah. played by uh, Yafikado. Um, yeah, um, and right. apparently he was a real what? handful. During right. the photography, right? Because he had all these ideas and he kept wanting to uh, evolve his character and came up with all these suggestions. And at one point, really, Scott was starting the day by coming to the set and saying, where's Yafet? So so he would just go the other way so he oh, wouldn't God. have to deal with him. Well, like, and they also him told him to, to annoy uh, Sigourney Weaver. Like, yes. Yes. To, 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 As to make their relationship real. Hitchcock did stuff like that. Some people, you know, like on The Exorcist, remember we heard about stories about how he, you know, Freakin would fire a gun on set, you know, oh God. Yeah. to scare people and freak them out, you know, and stuff. And so Ridley played this game with his actors where he told Yapit to screw with her and make yeah. her hate him, you know? Yeah. And it he worked. Like at they her. had a great antagonistic relationship. Yeah, and then Brett, played by Harry Dean Stanton, uh, yeah. he's uh, an um, he's an engineering technician. I think also uh, rest, he, rest in peace, right? I think he died. Yes, he's passed recently, away like and a couple so of did, years uh, ago. So did unfortunately Ash. You know, Ian Holm has recently yeah. passed, yeah. and he was also a Bilbo Baggins in Lord of the Rings. Right, right, yeah. Ash's goddamn robot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the alien uh, played by um, uh, Balaji Badehu. Thank you. It's hard to 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 actually pronounce it. <laughs> I think he only gave one interview right to Cine Fantastique uh, when they made a special about the alien episode. Yeah, uh, I have multiple film. copies of that issue. <laughs> yeah, you can still find it for maybe like sixteen bucks online. But uh, I have multiple copies in mint. Bagged and boarded. <laughs> and then Jonesy, the cat. Yeah, yeah. Played by several different cats. And then yeah, he four made different it to cats. The second four. one. I think he even made it to the third one. And then uh, theoretically, he's the last survivor of the Nostromo because <laughs> Ripley dies before the cat does. She, yeah, she Did left him behind. Did you guys see that book that we found? We, we put it to you on the, uh, the messenger messages. Uh, yeah, a graphic yeah. novel of his, his perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Of Jones, yeah. can, can, he's yeah. gonna let the humans take care of him. Yeah, <laughs> we can put that in the show notes if you want. You know how they did the scene where he hisses at the alien? Uh, they had a screen and they put a German Shepherd on the other side of the screen, and then they they beckoned the cat they to come over him to out. <laughs> yeah. treat or something, and then they pulled the, the screen and the German Shepherd, and that's why the cat stops and goes. Oh like, wow! Yeah, yep. that's how they did it. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say while we were early on, you know, with the spacecraft and the interior stuff was Ron Cobb was an amazing artist who contributed tremendously to the interior designs of the the Nostromo. All those hallways and hatchways and corridors and, you know, like Mother and all that stuff. You know, Ron Cobb was a, 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 a political cartoonist from L.A., but nobody knew that he could do spaceship and architectural, you know, like uh, engineering of spacecraft designs so well. But Dan O'Bannon met him and found that out and brought him on board. Yeah, his work definitely has kind of a Sid Mead kind of vibe to it in terms yeah. of uh, of the design and the the cool 
uh, aesthetic that he brings to the industrial um, work that he does. His, his website. In their suits. Yep. Yeah, the spacesuits here, as an example, like these hatches and stuff are Ron Cobb, but these spacesuits are Mobius. Mobius yeah. came on board as well and designed some stuff, and these spacesuits are right out of Mobius' sketches. Ron Cobb's website has a lot of his uh, art, concept art. He was a conceptual art designer for the movie. And if you go to roncobb.net, uh, that's his website. You can see all sorts of, like, chairs, hatches, uh, emblems, you know, that they have on their, uh, you know. The spacesuits and stuff. Space yeah, the upside-down zero-gravity yeah. design. The You know, like, he came up with a whole series of graphics, which, you know, in space, you know, for foreign language and everything like that, they're just graphics. They don't have words. But, you know, they show, like, what zero-gravity would be, which would be, like, an astronaut upside-down floating and stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was a, a little early. Uh, that thing where he, where uh, Ash starts jogging in place. It's like a little early hint that there's something not quite right with him. Right. Yeah. Right. He's a he's a goddamn robot. <laughs> yeah. The only things I didn't really like were Ron Cobb's yeah. original designs the for the alien creature. Scene. Yeah. One yeah. Of the yeah. Things, oh, mm, go, go ahead. I was going to say one of the things about the artists are that not only Ron Cobb, but another guy by the name of Chris Foss, who did a lot of space book cover designs, spaceship and designs for the exterior of the ships. And these guys were all part of the Dune team that originally Dan O'Bannon was working on mm. Alexander Jodorowsky's Dune in yeah. Paris, France. And so he met Giger, he met Chris Foss, he met Alejandro Jodorowsky, he met um, Mobius, you know, like all these people. People, they all ended up coming into Alien. Did you guys ever watch the documentary uh, Jodorowsky's Dune? No. Yes. Oh, I love it. It's amazing. Before I it's... lost my sight, I got to see that. Yeah, I love oh, it. yeah. That, that's such an amazing... It would have very little to do with the actual book, but it would have been an amazing movie nonetheless. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it would have been Jodorowsky's <laughs> yeah. own take on things. Yeah. The the Harkonnen chair was in a, in a, a Giger bar in Tokyo for a long time. Yeah, there, that? there is a whole bar, a Giger whole bar designed with multiple Harkonnen chairs and yeah. a whole room, you know, with the walls and everything. Yeah. And Giger's home and Giger's castle. There's all kinds of stuff like that, too. Yeah. 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 I think there's a that a bar, bar is, is closed down now, though. Ah, the Capo chair. You know that thing while they were still selling it on the Giger website? Uh, I think you could get one for a little over ten thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> pocket just a, change, just a little bit pocket out of reach. Change. Yeah, well, and it would yeah. it would take uh, several weeks to get one because they had to make it <laughs> custom. But uh, speaking of high end collectibles, I own a one to one scale full size head of the original Alien head. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, the sideshow collectibles put out. Uh, mine is a very early copy. Um, in other words, a low number on the run. And also I have, from the second movie, I also have a one-to-one -one full scale head and shoulders bust with some of the pipes and stuff on the uh, back yeah. from the second movie as well. That's, That's cool. not even the half of it. <laughs> he has alien stuff all over this place. <laughs> all he has over the house. Full-size yeah. alien out back. Yeah, I have a full standing statue that's like seven feet tall. I've got um, at least five or six. There's an alien unpainted. torso in our bedroom. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have. I have a complete costume that is from. An, uh, an event in in Scotland called, and in England, they, they did this thing alive, like a haunt. It was like a haunted house for Alien called Alien War. And uh, I acquired, you know, at quite high price, a full costume, head, oh, wow. backpack, everything. Amazing. So between, oh, the guess, two, between Alien and Aliens, do you, do you like Alien the best? Yes. Definitely. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. Although Aliens is next to, yeah, you know, very, very yeah. much like Hellraiser 1 and 2. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, yes. I like both of them because they kind of meld into each other and yeah. one takes place right after the other one ends. So they're approaching the derelict now. Ah. Um, that wonderful scene uh, where they, they give that money shot where you see the derelict and then the landscape yeah. of the planet that was created by H.R. Giger. Yeah, so right here. Ship. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. One of the people whose name I think should be mentioned with the the planet and everything is 
H.R. Giger had a guy by the name of Peter Vossi, Voisi, who was his like three dimensional guy. Like, in other words, you take a painting by Giger and you give it to Voisi, and he knew how to scale it into a three dimensional object by sculpting giant styrofoam blocks with <laughs> hot wires and stuff like that, and carving and yeah. a plaster crew and stuff. So, combining. Ooh, uh, tubing to the surface and uh, cover it up yes. with plasticine. So Giger designed it in two dimension first, then he did a model, a tabletop model, and then Peter Voise and a crew then built them into full-size sets, and, uh, which they, they don't get any credit for, really. I mean, yeah, and it, that planet surface was actually a mix of uh, not just glass painting, but also models and... Um, and full-size yeah. sets. Full-size sets, yeah. yeah. Which they use kids in spacesuits to make it look even bigger when they uh, approach the scene that's going to come up shortly when they uh, look at the space jockey. Right. And Actually, the space them. jockey, unfortunately, was on display in Los Angeles out in front of the Egyptian theater. And inside the place was some other props, you know, spacesuits and costumes and things. But outside, some idiot tunneling. firebombed it and destroyed yeah. the R prop. Religious was it, was people, it really right. completely dis destroyed? I don't know. I don't know. I think because in the documentary, they just said that some guy tried to set it on fire because it thought it was the work of the devil. I've I've heard that it was completely destroyed because nobody knows. I don't know anybody who knows what happened to it or where it was it in front now. of the Egyptian I, theater. I, the photographs look like it would have been savable. Yeah, oh, too really? bad. Which is but crazy because when it God came they out, gave everything to Bob Burns. You know? <laughs> in the Egyptian theater, they had not just the the eggs outside the theater or in the lobby. No, of the inside. Theater. I think those things were inside. <laughs> inside the lobby of the theater, because the jockey there are was photos. outside, and Some then there were took parts photos. of. Yeah, I know. We saw it in the documentary. And then right. there were uh, parts of the entrance to the, the movie theater that they covered the walls to make it look like the tunnels of the Nostromo, like the hallways. Right. But, I mean, there are photos that you probably have never seen because they were just published on Instagram recently that <laughs> certain people who were there, you know, have recently released a couple photos that wow. nobody's ever seen before. You know, they're not in that documentary. But, you know, it just goes to show you that at least a handful of people took some pictures, you know, before the thing got firebombed. They're climbing sure. up on the space jockey now. Yeah. So now, now here's where these are children. These yeah. are children in spacesuits, miniature spacesuits. Yeah. yeah, to make it seem there were, uh, I think, Ridley's kids and then one of the cameraman's kids as well. Right. And it, actually, the adult Ridley's kid was photographed not too long ago next to the little space suit because oh. it still exists. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. So this is a real set. This is a real, yeah. real thing. This is where you see this is a top A class production here because it's I think just not Gicker quite as big as it looks because of the using, like you said, using the children in the spacesuits. Yeah, also, and they brought this whole thing back in Prometheus. Yeah, right, uh, right. Yeah, well, the 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 uh, the, um, the space jockeys. Yes. Yeah, um, I. Th it felt a little bit like a cop out to me to make that space jockey like just a space suit that the, that the yeah. engineers fit themselves into. I kind of like. Oh, uh, you know, awesome. I, I, I thought that they should right? be aliens. Yeah, that that yeah. would be a race of yeah. aliens. Yeah, like and and that space jockey was like biomechanically. Built into the Bonded spaceship, into yeah. The chair. yeah, yeah. Well, and those are his ribs, right? You know, it's like yep. I don't know. Well, that's what they are called anyway. I mean, who knows? You know, like yeah. in the film, it's just Dallas's opinion. You know, well, it's yeah. controversial the way that they changed some things for the the Prometheus movie. I yeah. mean, they were trying to create something new based on kind of a splinter off of the Alien series. And then with Alien Covenant, they just went right back into the Alien series. You know, the yeah, Colorado. and and it seems like there's supposed to be another one, but it's, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Yeah, maybe not. Um, but let me say something real quick about how they shot this. One of the things about you know the the space jockey is it's kind of like on a turntable. It's on a round thing, and the walls around it they didn't actually make all those walls. They had one like like let's say for instance you're looking at a pizza. You know one or two slices of the pie would be just one part of the wall, and they kept spinning the chair oh. and photographing the wall and photographing the wall, and so it appeared like the whole room was surrounding with that texture and stuff but in fact they only made a section of it oh that's Ooh, cool magic yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey it's like in computer games when you're inside a room 
when you your character is not looking at the other part of the room, it's not being rendered. There, it's there was an occlusion. There was an Aliens comic that had uh, the space jockey race, and they were like these elephant people. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because the hose that's on yeah. his nose kind yeah. of is a temp- trunk kind of. Yeah, it, it, interesting. And X was back, and uh, Newt, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember those before yeah. Alien Comics. 3 came out, yeah. A little anecdote here about the laser beam that's being used is, I believe they borrowed that from Pink Floyd or some heavy metal rock band over in England. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it does remind you of uh, old concerts where they would have the, the laser beams flat and stuff. surface of laser over the yeah. people's hands. Yeah, yeah. And the idea here is that if you break the beam, you know, you've like set off an alarm that begins a, a cycle of the eggs starting to warm up and yeah. getting ready to pop, you know? Yeah. And That's then all you have to do I is never, touch one of them. I never really thought about where the laser came from. Um, uh, I, I, when I saw the movie the first time, I didn't associate that the eggs would be cargo. I assumed that the eggs were put there by an invading like species that found the spaceship. And then later on, I did realize that, you know what? But yeah, they could be carrying the eggs. The space jockey could be carrying the bombs. Yeah. Yeah. And then in Prometheus, they really roll with that whole. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right, so yeah. so the, it's like the an environment that's controlled, like yeah, it's a controlled. Uh, that's true, and, that and and I think as a when I used to watch this as a teenager, I always assumed that the f- the 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 layer of mist was produced by the eggs, but you know, yeah, this is it, like an egg. This is like an egg chamber. Like originally in the film, you guys heard about the egg silo, right? Yeah, originally yeah. there was going to be a pyramid and an egg silo, yeah. and they were going to have to climb this thing and go, go down it on rope. But instead, they ended up making it the hole in the base of the space jockey. You go down into that hole, and now you're down into the egg chamber. You know, yeah. And eventually, they did bring the egg silo into Prometheus. Well, and, right. and so presumably, when we're watching this movie, you assume that. Somehow one of the one of the face huggers got onto the space jockey who can't move because he's attached to the chair, you know. And and uh, and uh, I never thought about it. I yeah. never thought that. How did that happen to him? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, the instrument that's attached to the chair that all always struck me as kind of like a, a weapon, almost like maybe. a telescope of sorts. Yeah. You know, or, or maybe navigate. a weapon. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I thought he was kind of a cannon. navigator too. Yeah, more of a. And here yeah, they, they call used, him the space jockey. Yeah, you know. yeah, like right. he's riding on something, he's jockeying it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the egg here is transparent because they made it with fiberglass, and they used more fiberglass than you know plaster. And then yeah. when you see it move inside, the little thing going like, tuk, 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 it's actually Ridley Scott's hands inside gloves, uh, oh. and he's he's got them like a you know, side to side like a bird and he's just wiggling his fingers and he had his hands inside the egg and he was doing that. But the thing is that when he said that, you know, on the documentary, he didn't, you know, he didn't bother to explain how he was actually behind a piece of what's called tripe, which is stomach lining of yeah. a cow. Gross. And it makes him it, his, his gloves, his rubber gloves were completely hidden. You cannot see them. The only thing you can see is a backlight. You know, there's a backlight yeah. and there's like translucent, you know, light through the egg. And that's his arms and his hands moving them and stuff. And so the, like when you look down from the down position of of the act the actor you know looking into the egg that you can't see his hands or nothing you just see that tripe yeah. you know that yeah. stomach lining that's one of those shots carefully that dressed in there carrying him back well and ah. K- kane actually has a gun and it makes you think are there more of those guns on the ship that they never used Actually, I've heard that that isn't necessarily a bang bang gun. It's a tool of some kind, like you know how like we might have a welding torch or something. Yeah. You know, it's something like that. So because uh, they have to improvise the weapons, remember? Yeah, it's uh, that, that shot of Ash <laughs> just walking into the lobby and getting ready and just looking around. It's just uh, foreshadowing. That yeah, like, oh, yeah. But it's time to get into action here. But you know, I have got- to admit, I mean, I don't know if anybody guessed that he was an android. I mean, that was probably a big surprise, oh, yeah. you know, to the crew at the same time as the audience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Ash is a goddamn robot. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's that weird part where he's looking at Ridley, uh, at uh, Ripley, I think, and there's this weird drop of like white sweat that's that rolls sweat. down. Yeah, that's milk. Milk yeah. Yeah. sweat. And I'm like, that's weird. Why is? Yeah. What is that? Yeah. yeah and, also, and, Ridley talks about that in the whole sequence as him. Do robots? Do androids? Do he called them a humanoid? Yeah, do they get horns. horny? Do they have sex? You know? Do they? You know? He was gonna rape her, kind of. Like in Japanese movies, when the character is excited, they give him a nosebleed or they give him a big drop of sweat. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of sexual stuff, you know, in the undertones of this, you know. Oh, they went yeah, a lot into the, the... They're taking his helmet off. Oh, they cut the helmet off. So funny thing, there's a, a short documentary that you sent us to watch at um, where... Giger made a documentary with a 16 millimeter camera about the work he did on set. And one of the things he said about the eggs was that originally the opening of the oh, eggs yes. was supposed to look a more single like, slit. Yeah. like a vagina. Right. So, right. but then that they told him, yeah, we can't do that. We it's can't like, get away with that in Catholic yeah. countries. <laughs> I was like, well, let's just put two of them there. <laughs> let's yeah. make a square. Let's make a crisscross yeah, thing. We'll make an X. You know? You know? So that's how they did it. Right. And of course, that's such a Giger thing to do. Yeah. Well, I know and, it's and, art. So a she, vagina. So uh, Ripley just said, "If we break co- quarantine, we could all die," which unfortunately right. has become a, a meme for the times of today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know, right? But uh, uh, Ash is the guy who opens the door. Because yes. right. yeah, because he is following he, a different drum. Yeah, he has ul- ulterior his, his, uh, ulterior motives. Yeah, he's got his own agenda, hidden agenda. Yeah, and this is where they're trying to uh, pull out the fingers. Originally, Giger's design had the fingers on uh, top, the finger, find out on about top the of the alien uh, body, the face hugger. Yeah. And then a guy from the special effects said, why don't we put them on the sides? That way it would be more creepy. And give Actually, it, like, it was Ron Cobb who said that. And they oh, said, yeah, okay. Yeah, better idea. You know? Yeah, it's, yeah, like, yeah. it's like a pair of hands. Yeah, because it grabs you. The fingers grab yeah. you around the back of your head, and, and then the, the, tube the down your probe throat. goes down your throat. You know. And Giger had uh, had thought from an engineering point of view that the tail would be the spring that launches it out of the egg. So this scene, I don't think, was in the theatrical cut, right? Of, of uh, Lambert attacking, uh, slapping her. Slapping yeah, her. yeah. I don't think that was in the theatrical version, right? I think that's new that's for this. Correct. Yeah, that director's was correct. cut. That's correct. And actually, tell I'll tell the story about what happened with that. There was like two takes, you know, and the first time she went to slap her and she ducked or something. And so the second time she like faked her out. She like swung with one hand and she ducked and she smacked her and she pushed her wow. face as she was ducking. She her own body weight and momentum made her slap into the face, you know, the hand harder than it fit. If it had just been a oh, wow. you know stage slap, you know, so she really connected and really smacked her, Ouch. and Sigourney Weaver broke into tears and ran off set. And yeah, got upset oh, about. It. She got upset because she didn't think Ripley should be crying. Right. Oh yeah. Because she and too also probably because she was surprised. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, and and this line from uh, from Parker, how come they don't freeze him? It's like nobody Great listens. Idea. Nobody Great listens idea. to him, and it's like yeah. Too. Even even for Ash, that would have made sense. But see, right? they have it, their own agenda. You know, he no, wants well, to make sure he incubates. You know. Well, does he or is he? I mean, bringing the thing back should be good enough. Not necessarily. If you're a robot, you can let them all be ingested. You can let them all. The whole ship could be full of aliens, and he'd be the only well, thing if, left. If, if, if he acid. even knows how the aliens work, he I doesn't. Mean, at this but point. He did, that, that's, that's, that's why he's letting it run its course. He wants right. to yeah. He doesn't care about the humans. Well, and, Dal- and, 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 and Dallas is him. just what, like wanting to, 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 to get it off him at any cost. And, right. and, and Ash is like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Right. Let's see what happens. Cause yeah. Ash is willing to try it, you know? Yeah. And, and really, uh, really the acid went. Parker is the only one who makes sense and nobody's listening to him. Right. Well, it's cause he's from under the decks, right? He's the lower deck guy. Yeah. Well, and same with with Ripley too, wanting them to just stay out and for twenty four. Which that would you know that is aggravating. It's quarantine. like yeah, they follow should have the followed quarantine. the quarantine procedure, but then it wouldn't have been a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> they had. Um, here's the acid uh, for blood, where it goes through several yeah. levels of the spaceship. I think right. you're, now, you're like, I think you're a few seconds ahead of me here because they haven't cut it yet on mine. 
Really? Well, the effect on how they did it was, you know how, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, like, if you have a styrofoam object and you were to pour, like, acetone or lighter fluid or something yeah. like that polish on it, remover. nail polish remover, it'll yeah. melt it, right? Oh, yeah, and styrofoam, yeah. So, I think so you watching a different version, Ryan, because... I'm, I'm watching here, the two, 2003 director's cut. Well, on the, my copy, there are already several decks below and they're touching yeah, the Yeah, they just the started hole. running down With the, the pen. Thing. We are take some are, you, and are says, you watching a copy of a PAL version that was running a little faster? Maybe that's it. That's uh, fine. That's fine. Let's keep going. Just let it run. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyways, he borrows a pen from, <laughs> I think, from Brett. He yes. says, hey, let, me, let me borrow that. You know? And then he picks it, sticks it in the acid. And then when he's done, he's like, here. And he gives it back to him. He's like, <laughs> it's like oh, looking at it like, man, I don't want this, this anymore. No, and what am Harry I Dean do with Stanton, <laughs> uh, he didn't. One of the first things he said to Ridley Scott when he was being cast, it was like, "Yeah, I don't like space movies and I don't like horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like monster pictures. I don't yeah. like monster pictures." Yeah, and he doesn't say much in this movie. He pretty much just agrees yeah. with the. Uh, his buddy character. Well, it, it makes yeah. him. It makes him a good grumpy, uh, grumpy character. Below decks guy. Yeah. And and the, the great kind of thing people, about his, his lines is all he has to ever say is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a, bil- a billion different ways to say right. I, right I, I think Parker right might that, be you know? might be my favorite character. I, I always use that line. I'm not drawing any straws. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm all for killing this. <laughs> yeah. So we're in the sick bay now, and uh, we see John Hurt's characters on the table, and they're just slowly panning around the room. And you really get a chance to see an HD, like, the amazing quality of these sets. It looks like a genuinely lived on spaceship. You know, what's weird too, is his underwear. What's with this weird underwear? Hey, you know, I mean, at least it's not <laughs> star Wars where Lucas told, uh, Carrie Fisher that there's no underwear in space, right? No bra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like dead pit. We didn't have underwear for our zombies either. Oh, no bras. <laughs> and I, and I like, uh, I like Brett's Hawaiian shirt too. Yes, yes. <laughs> you would. I, I like the little character pieces, too, like the fact that Brett's always rolling hand-rolled cigarettes of some type yeah. of tobacco. We don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so funny thing about Alien, uh, before Ridley Scott found uh, um, Bolaji Bedejo, yes. he actually had tested Peter Mayhew yeah. as right. was Chewbacca for the Alien. And also tested Han Solo for uh, Dallas. <laughs> yeah, Harrison Ford. Right. So it could have been a weird alternate universe where Peter Mayhew Chewbacca kills Han Solo Dallas. Yeah. And and, and uh, John Hurt uh, was a replacement for the original actor that was going to play John Hurt. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, when they were on set, he found out he was diabetic and they had to carry them out of the, the set because yeah. he was just turning yellow. And he's like, oh, I feel terrible. And I was like, what's going on? And took him to the hospital. He was diabetic. So. Right. So they had to recast at the 11th hour. Oh, yeah. Literally at the 11th hour, they went to the hotel to talk to John Hurd. And it's like, when do you want me to start? Tomorrow. Wow. Wow. They had communicated with him earlier, but he was unavailable. So yeah. suddenly he, his project was over and he was available. So lucky them. So some things that they did for uh, Bolaji was that they gave him Tai Chi lessons and stuff so he could learn to slow down his movements. Ah. Yeah. It's interesting the difference between alien and aliens, too. Like, the the, the, the creature in Alien <coughs> moves slowly, right? It's It kind of creeps up on people. Right, but it does move <coughs> quickly, too. Remember in the scene with Yapakoto? It whips the tail and it whips yeah. and turns yeah. around and... You know, it gets but it doesn't. It it, but it doesn't him. run like they no. do in Aliens. No. Think, but you know what's interesting about Alien versus Aliens is that in Aliens they don't have any Balaji Bodejos. There's no big seven foot tall skinny guys yeah. wearing the suit. You know they yeah. couldn't find people like that, so they mainly got dancers and you know acrobats and you know mimes and things like that to wear the suits. And they hooked them up to harnesses with yeah. like bungee cords and things like that, and they were able to bounce them around. Literally, they could leap and bounce off walls and stuff. Yeah. I like this conversation between Ripley and, and Ash. It's so uh, awkward. Yeah. Yep. And he's having a glass of milk. 
Yeah. <laughs> Blue milk, like Star Wars. Yeah, no. that's just white. <laughs> but it's like it's kind of a foreshadowing again to the fact For that ass. He's, he's completely ass. made out of. And so it makes you wonder: Do they know that he's an android or not? It's kind of she speaks to him like she would speak to a person, but also it seems like there's a certain tension there, like she's chiding him because he's kind of like a tool not doing his job right. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I'm I right. love how Dallas listens to classical music in the shuttle when he wants to get away from everybody. Yeah, and it kind of introduces us to the shuttle as a little safe space, kind of for what was foreshadowing. That shuttle called the Narcissus or something. Yes, like that? yeah, yes. the Narcissus. Yeah, tiny little shuttle that's going to be really handy at the end. Yes. <laughs> And yeah, Jeff Bob Goldsmith. Burns owns it, the model that's left over after production. They gave it to Bob Burns. What doesn't he own, really? <laughs> he, he's even got stuff from the second movie, too, like the oh, Sulaco, wow. the big spacecraft yeah. from that movie. They gave him yeah. that, too. Uh, Julian Perry, who was um, second unit and uh, miniature um, uh, artist in Nightbreed, he actually also worked in Aliens, the second one, so... Oh, oh, cool. I just thought I'd drop that a little bit of trivia. Now I'm looking for the face hugger. Ah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is it's great. <laughs> I love these little probes that have a little light on the end of them. It's like, oh, yeah. you know, where, where do you get those, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, and Clive Barker had said, uh, relating to Alien versus Aliens, he said, that creature from Alien, you know, if machine guns wouldn't have done anything to it, the bullets would have bounced right off of it. You know, making it like this juggernaut that's, you know, unkillable. Well, also that the biomechanical skin design maybe makes it like metal, like armor, you know, like yeah. you can't pierce it, you know? Yeah. It's like a big bug carapace. I always right. thought yeah. that, that Oh, was you know, like there's one other scene that's not in any of the versions as far as I know. I saw a still photograph on the cover of Famous Monsters of Filmland – there's a part in the movie that was the alien is in a hallway and Parker comes across it. And there's like a airlock door between the, the airlock door and Parker is the alien. And so if he could seal it into that area and open the airlock and blow it out into space. And what he's trying to do is get a light. That's like a green emerald light to flash so that the alien will be attracted to it and start walking that way oh, so wow. that then he can slam the door and the alien at the last minute turns and leaps and gets out of that room. But the arm gets chopped off by the door coming down. Oh. So sp spurting acid blood comes all over the place. But that scene isn't in the movie. It got cut, but it did yeah. get part of it got filmed. It's kind of like uh Pinhead with the the you know and and the female with masks on in in Hellbound. So then it grows its arm back. I, who knows? It's not in the film. Yeah. That scene's cut. You know, just yeah. like Dallas's egg cocoon was cut originally. Yeah, yeah. A bit of trivia. So we see the little face hugger dead on the floor, and Ash is poking it with that little probe, and you see the underside of the alien, and it looks so gross and slimy, and all this oh, like, yeah. meat. And those are actually uh, oysters and bits of crab and stuff that Ridley Scott yeah, got from the market. Yeah, and kidneys yeah. and things like that. They just displayed that. They made like a – so the, the rest of the body of the face hugger is made out of rubber, and there was like a cup-holding section in the middle. And they just – before they shot the scene, they got – that's an oyster that he's lifting up right now. And, and he actually, just – Actually, Ridley that. himself laid all those in there the way he yeah. wanted them. So that's why it looks so real and so slimy yeah. and so biological, yeah. you know? Yeah, because nothing looks better than something that's really organically real, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you know what's interesting is I have made, I have my own molds, I have made my own face huggers, I have made my own eggs, I have made my own full alien wow. suits, I have all the molds, I've, I've got it all because I've done for years, ever since the movie came out, right after the movie, like in, you know, the movie came out in the 70s, by 1980, I was making a haunted house with mm -hmm. the aliens. Oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> so I've been doing it for the past almost 30 something years, you know, and that, that was so, a time when people couldn't just go watch the movie anytime they felt like it. It was no, out of the theater it took a long time and, for yeah. the VHS to even come out. Yeah. So a quick question here is that the head of the alien that we know, uh, uh today, 
um, it's very different from the original Alien Head because the original Alien Head, it's not super visible in this movie. It's transparent. It's, it's transparent, right? Transparent. And you see a skull underneath, a skull right, shape. Right, a human and skull. And then for the second one, they kind of just made it all black and shiny, and it looks mm. even more alien, more like ant-like. And the head was developed by Carlo Rambaldi, right? Well, just the mechanics, you know, Giger's mechanics. design, you know, they sculpted it, they've used bones, they used a real human <coughs> skull, you uh-huh. know, Giger and the crew there at the, you know, studio where they were making right. a movie. With they made the that, mechanism for the second little mouth that comes out and all that stuff, Well, right? he made the whole thing. I mean, like, in other words, they gave him a casting, a fiberglass casting of Giger's design. He took it back to his shop and he cut it apart and mechanized the jaw and mechanized the lower, you know, the inner jaw and mechanized mechanized the little teeth on the inner lower jaw mm. blah 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 and then when they brought it to the studio really didn't like seeing all the wires and springs and stuff so then they covered it up with condoms oh so you can see translucent thin layered rubber condoms covering over like the hinged springs and things around the jaw you know for the mechanism but there's these big cables and big handles you know that would be pulled that would operate the jaw and the inner mechanism and all that on a separate head that Balaji didn't wear you know, that was an, an insert head they're taking here. off from the surface of the planet now and uh, one of the funniest things about why I was bringing up Rambaldi is that he made this alien for uh, the alien head 1979 and then in 1981 he was working on ET and he made the uh, ET alien oh yes yes <laughs> Which is a completely different side yeah. of the spectrum in terms of what an alien yeah. would look like. Well, and this is but only again, two years after Star Wars, and it's such a 180 degree turn from what Star Wars is. I mean, and it's, yeah. it's it, they're both good, but just in, in way different ways. Yeah, one's science fantasy, the other one's horror science. Yeah, and kind of hard science fiction, right? I mean, it's like a, a gritty, a gritty kind of more realistic version of what science fiction would be or you know what the future it might be yes and no i mean they don't really explain any of the star drives or any of that oh kind no of stuff, yeah, yeah 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 but well the uh, thing is for this movie i don't hard think science fiction that usually means that the science is good like 2000 yeah, like star trek or babylon yeah. 5 or stuff like that where the, well, oh, the dilithium crystals in the that's not, yeah, well fantasy. that's not realistic yeah the, the crystal is right. just a you know, it's that's it's a MacGuffin. Yeah. yeah, it's just a techno babble. Yeah, but 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 it's techno babble that tries to explain a little bit of what's behind it. Whereas it's like Luke goes to Dagobah system on a fighter, and it's like how would he even go on a fighter between systems between solar systems? You know, yeah. it yeah, doesn't matter. It's a star drive; it jumps to yeah. hyperspace. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. But anyways, the the thing about um, you know, the, Nina was just saying something about how look at how many people are smoking. Yeah, yeah. In, inside um, of a spaceship. Yeah. Still, you could still smoke on an airplane back yeah. in those days. And in a spacecraft, you know, you wouldn't be able to smoke in a spacecraft. Right, because yeah. it would be a so pressurized, oxygenated atmosphere. It wouldn't be able to do that. But, yeah, yeah. it's just because, you know, it was back in the 70s. Everybody well, they wanted to make them space truckers, too, so that they had yeah. grittiness, you know. They drink beer. There's beers in there, too. Yeah. Space beer. <laughs> So what do you guys think of the the aliens um life cycle? Cuz there was there was um and I had I had heard this before on a different documentary but the idea that the alien starts out a light color and as it gets older it gets darker and darker until it's black and and even at the end they said oh, it was looking for a place to die inside of the shuttle like it had already laid its eggs and and had well, set, in the set up Dallas and used- yeah, and uh, they do talk about how initially they wanted it to be transparent or translucent yeah. at the best. Yeah, and, and then that it, as it <clears throat> ages, it gets more opaque. You know, yeah, and turns as, black. As you said. Yeah, yeah. But um, one of the things also, you know, I think about the the life cycle is. Do you remember from the early, you know, pre-production they had this hieroglyphic pyramid painting that Giger had done that showed the whole life cycle of yeah. the creature. Mm-hmm. And that isn't included anywhere in the film, but it's in the art books and things like that. So they would bring you know, it back in uh, Prometheus in a way. Yeah. yeah, but the what I was getting at is that 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 in in at least this director's cut, you know, with the restored thing with with uh, the cocoon of Dallas and and uh, Brett. You know that this alien only lives for like a couple of day a day maybe or two. I, I don't think that's that I don't think that's plain in the film itself. At, you know, 
the well, the idea that it was it was it was uh, huddling up into the shuttle to die because it had already put out eggs I to, never to, heard to, to incubate into. Yeah. I never heard that before that it was going to be dying. I heard that it was right. just huddling, hibernating. In there to get, yeah, just to get a place. Well, to and hide, that's you know? true. But but I did hear before. You know, and we're talking about this little this YouTube video, the twenty facts you didn't know about Alien. I think right. But that but, stuff's not necessarily accurate. All those things. You know? Yeah, but but I did hear before for um for a long time about its skin changing color from translucent to darker and and that that tracks with what what uh ash said about it replacing its cells with polarized silicon hmm. right that it's right. it's hardening it's itself to, of, to of the, the adverse environments the yeah i wouldn't take right? that too I wouldn't take that too much to heart because in, out of all the other films and stuff, it's not, you know, they never delve into that again. You know, well, if like I can get into the answer to this on my, on my perspective, I, I think, the Oh, here he comes. Chess oh, chess burster. Burster. Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my <laughs> right band gal. And they even bring John Hurt to space balls. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's a great shot. Yep. But I actually in my have a view, casting of that space balls. Alien creature. <laughs> I know somebody really? worked on That's that. That's awesome. So, yeah. The little legs and top hat. Yeah. So well, I don't have the legs. It so my perspective, my perspective on the life cycle is that um, I think that there's plenty of animals and insects that change shape as they mature. Um, yeah, the larvae, the pupae, the you know, yeah, eventually and even birds. Birds, you know, the birds and ducks that start out yellow and then they turn into a completely different, like a mallard. Yeah. Um, I think it's just. And you bring a good point, Ryan, the whole thing about the, the, the cells being replaced by polarized silicone. And it's just, Silica. I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's the, the matureness of the life cycle, the, mm-hmm. the maturing of the, the alien, which is like, of course, there's plenty of yeah. questions we can come up with. Like, what was he eating to grow up from that tiny little thing into like a or Yeah, he got big thing. awful fast. Huh? Maybe, you know? maybe they're packed with all that energy from the time they're born and they don't, maybe they don't need to eat well, that much. We can't answer these well, questions just hypothetically. That we breaks, go with the, that breaks the laws of mass conservation. The, but uh, <laughs> the it, writers, you know, yeah. they... Road, but I it? think that the alien, I see the alien as kind of like almost immortal because I don't think they even talk about how much of a, a perfect organism he is. Yeah. And in all the movies that we've seen in Alien where there's like all these old um, structures and they're full of aliens, we never know how long they've been there. It seems like these aliens would – true, they do build walls and layers mm-hmm. that seem to be made out of parts of other aliens, right? <laughs> Um, but at the yeah. same time, <clears throat> I, Can I say thought, something real quick about the death. Of yeah. The let me just, yeah. let me just finish. Uh, let okay. me just finish this and then you'll talk about the little wooden sculpture and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the alien wasn't huddling up to die in my view uh, yeah. of the movie. Neither. I mind. think it was just hiding like they do in the other movies where you see that they hide in the walls They're and they just stay there. Yeah. Yeah. They're cocooning, right. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, just the fact that the I think it was Martin Bauer sculpted that little figure of the the dead, uh, you know, figure of the man, you know, wrapped up in like a mummy bag, you know, oh. and they shot it out of the the ship, you know. They had this giant, like uh, I think what he said it was like either forty or seventy foot long trench model, kind of like the trench from Star Wars, you know, for the Death Star trench, mm-hmm. and they used a giant catapulting thing that you fling <coughs> bait out into a lake, you know, like when you're fishing from a boat. They have these little bait catapults, and they got this bait catapult, and they use that to fling the little sculpted mm-hmm. figure of the guy in the, you know, the dead body out of the ship, and they filmed it in high speed photography and slowed it down, and that's how they did that shot. Uh-huh. Well, so and and also what I was getting at with the life cycle too is that it uh, it sort of makes this this creature completely self sufficient, right? I mean, there's no there's no queen. It laid it own, laid its own eggs. Well, yeah, not and, according to James Cameron. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, well, we're not on that movie yet, right? I mean, it's, they, they hadn't even thought of, of that stuff yet. Yeah, It's kind of a mess when you look at the movies as an a, a, a as a ongoing... As a yeah. whole, yeah. yeah. Right, so... One, some of it says it's spores. Some of it says it's eggs. Some of it says that you know the aliens can turn their victims into cocoons that will turn into eggs. Some of them say that there's a queen that lays the eggs, and right. that's the thing about this life cycle of the creature that's always been so um, hard to put down, right? Because yeah, 
seems like every writer tries to come up with something different. Yeah, yeah you look at the comic books, yeah. and they're all different, too. They it doesn't make a lot of biological sense. Yeah, yeah, well, and James Cameron just wanted to ramp up the action in, you know, take the first movie, but make it ramp up the action. In like what's, a war movie. What, what could be made bigger? Made a Vietnam war movie. Yeah, and, and what could be a bigger uh, climax than, than fighting, sending this alien into the airlock? It's like, oh, you, you, you got a giant queen alien. But I yeah, like the awesome. Queen. I think it's a great addition to the yeah. uh, the. Yeah, I, I do too. But but looking, it doesn't make sense with this director's cut and the and the the alien being able to create its own eggs and and well, uh, its own hosts out of keep these. Keep in mind that, that there are it, animals in nature that can switch genders, and they can actually like if there's a population where there's nothing but males, uh, yeah. certain kinds of of animals and and crabs or whatever, yeah. and insects, they can switch genders and become female, so they can find a way to procreate. It's like it's like. Um, it's like that guy in uh, Jurassic Park, right? Like uh, nature uh, 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 finds a way. Yeah. But, but if there's only one, though, I mean, then it can it can create two eggs. I don't know. Well, a bird I think can it, I think it is better I think you're off worrying I, about the, the details too much. This, this I think that this one. this movie would be it is better off without that. I mean, I think that scene is cool and it's neat to see something that they shot, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. it it doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, a right. bird can lay many eggs, Ryan. Also, um, you well, just need have, something to you, fertilize them. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. There's only one alien. But in this case, it's a parasite. So it lays the eggs, and then the eggs attach themselves to a host. So it doesn't really need to be fertilized. So within the egg, there is an embryo of a parasite waiting to attach itself to a host. And then it melds with the DNA of the host, and then it creates a DNA. So yeah. in the various movies, right, the alien was supposed to be slightly different depending on the host. Like yeah. in Alien 3, it was supposed to be right, looking a little right. different because it was Which is why it can, it can feed uh, Kane oxygen while he's – because it's learning right. its physiology. Good point, yeah. Yeah. But um, one of the, the things about uh, the, um, you know, the, the, this part, you know, with once Kane is dead, you know, and now, you know, now they're hunting it, you know, and the scene, you know, that's coming up, you know, where the alien is up in the, the chains and the dripping water and, you know, yeah. Brett is going up there to put his head up and look up and then the alien grabs him and sucks him up into the chains and stuff. Yeah. That scene is actually being Jones shot Jones. with somebody other than Balaji Badejo. They uh-huh. had to use like it's a, a stunt stuntman, man. like an acrobatic stuntman on a harness rig and everything. And so the costume is different as well. They had to make a special alien suit that fit that particular person. And the head is not the same head either. It's like mm-hmm. a shrunk down version of the head that's lighter weight. And eventually that head, that stunt head, made its way into American Halloween mask company Distortions Unlimited's hands, oh. and they released it as a available, you know, alien head, you know, rubber mask you could buy. Oh. That's cool. But it was so the, down. It wasn't as big as the Balaji one. So poor Jonesy got scared, and now this entire sequence with Brett uh, walking through the spaceship as the camera follows him, it's just masterfully done. There's no dialogue. It's just pure tension. Yeah. And it's it's really great. Yeah, there's no dialogue from this point. And on, you can tell when they when they start switching to close-ups of his face that oh, now he's in trouble. Man, this is a cool spaceship. Just yeah. the, the, the the underbelly of the spaceship looks so real. Yeah. Yeah, the the way that they so shot perfect. the scene, you know, where the the Noso, the um, Nostromo separates from the big oil platform rig. Yeah. They had that model connected to a forklift and the forklift was covered with black velvet and they just backed the forklift up there was no Mm -hmm. motorized no motion control no nothing and they just backed up the forklift and filmed you know and did it real smooth yeah that's how they separate that that section so this movie Originally was going to have, I think, a $4 million budget. Then they found, then, like you said, uh, it was going to be $2 million. They were going to get it, Roger Corman to make it. And it was going to be a $2 million budget. Then, oh, yeah, Roger yeah. Corman. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and then finally, it ended up being $8 million. And then I looked at Box Office Mojo. The domestic gross of this movie was $79 million. International, wow. 
22.7 and wow. it ended up making worldwide over a hundred million dollars. So wow. what Great a hit. investment. Yeah. Yep. And a whole franchise was created. Yep, absolutely. And products and toys. Oh, have you guys heard about back when the film came out in the 70s? They released a toy, an alien yeah, toy. Yeah. And it and was Kenner? hideous. Yeah. I think it was Kenner. Right? Yeah, and it, and it was uh, even back in the uh, 80s trying to get a hold of that. It was like 500 bucks, you know, because oh, yeah. it was so rare. And yep. it, it scared the it, it scared the crap out of kids, and it got banned or something. I think. Yep. Yep. Well, it was just so phallic and everything. You know, yeah. it's like this is an R-rated movie. What little yeah. kids are going to get to go see it? What yeah. little kids are going to know what that is or want to buy it? Although, Although that doesn't that doesn't stop toy companies anymore. They make toys for all kinds of R-rated. Yeah, but this movies. was the seventies. Yeah. It was a different era. You know? Now there's saying. all these kids yeah. from the seventies that are forty and have disposable income, and they'll buy anything. Yeah, uh, right. Like us, but. Uh, there was also a planned ride for Disney parks that was going to involve Alien, and it was eventually canceled. They did do it. They're in Florida, they did do it for a short time, and it was very scary and violent and you know, freaked people out, and they did cancel it after a very short time. I think and it was now all not, you see is not a, even a year. We a small cameo in the great movie San adventure. You and I had. Yeah, but that was Aliens. Okay, that was fun. They're still in the, I think it's in one of the Disney parks, the great movie adventure. There's a section of, uh, of the, the, the car ride where you go through one of the Nostromo's tunnels and then all of a sudden there's an alien that pops up on, the, on, on top of you, like on a little, like, uh, you know, a little ceiling hole. And you see like an alien go down like, like there's a little bit of smoke and then it goes back up and you pass by and you see a Ripley holding like a flamethrower. And that's pretty much it. That's all it is. That, that's that, cool, though, th just to be able to see an alien, a full creature, you know, in person, even if it's a robot or whatever, I would yeah. love it. Yeah. This this little the little scene of the alien swaying back and forth in the chains up above. Was that in the theatrical version? Yes. yes. OK. And, and that's it may be that, that I'm I'm, I about. just got used to seeing it on home video and not in high definition that I'd never noticed it before. Right. You couldn't really see it up there because even on set, they said when you looked up, it was really hard to see the alien amongst all the chains and yeah. dripping water. And, everything. And, and that's something that has persisted through all the alien movies is them being able to blend into their background in this kind of and you don't notice them until they start moving, which is kind of neat. I like the way they do that. Right. Plus, Ridley smoked everything up, and he had a lot of diffusion on the lens and stuff. Yeah. You know? But it's, this guy that was hanging upside down, I mean, that's a really hard thing to do, you know, with an yeah. alien costume with a big tail on it and everything. Yeah. And so, like I was saying, that that particular guy had to have a special custom-made suit, and the head couldn't be as big and didn't have that big clear dome on it and stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, and... So when he says, I don't know what it was, but it was big, like a man, do you think at this point, he? do you think he saw it? Yeah, yeah. He saw it taking Brett up into the oh, rafters okay. and, and got away, you know. He yeah. saw the tail end of it. So that's another thing that makes me hate this explanation that the alien went to die in the shuttle. Because, like, really it's going to grow up to be eight feet tall, but then it only lives for a day? I, I really I mean, don't come buy on. that. Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't buy that. <laughs> yeah. Get off that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's but, a lot uh, of uh, blog articles and like little, you know, clickbait videos of 20 facts you don't know about. And whenever they're ones about like Clive Barker stuff, we always are like, wrong. oh, God, yeah, here we go. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's like yeah. a combination of something they heard in a documentary and, you know, they kind of fudge it. And or write, trivia but, yeah. they got off of IMDb that's not right. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, like, so, for instance, like Carlo Rimbaldi, like I was going to talk about Carlo Rimbaldi a little bit more about how he always gets all kinds of credit, like on these movies, like King Kong or in Alien. I mean, he's a good mechanical guy, but he doesn't sculpt or design or mold or cast these monsters. The few movies that he did, like E.T., he did not sculpt or design E.T., you know, Craig Reardon and, uh, you know, a, a lot of other people, Tom, uh, I mean, um, uh, Robert Short, you know, Bob Short and people like that. They were yeah, sure. on, on they made the heart light. They made the, you know, what Rumbaldi did was yeah. make like the head extension of the, alien, you know, the E.T. and stuff. Yeah. You know, certain mechanical things, the eye blinks, you know, he's a mechanical guy. They just have to simplify it for the public. 
And what's really awesome in the head is that they even had this mechanism that would twist the lip of the head. So you see the snarl of yeah, the right. alien, yeah, right? so all cool. that stuff. Wires and, uh, and cables. If I could do just a quick breaking breaking news for Barker Cast right now, as we record this on Saturday, uh, the new Clyde Barker store just launched. I got an oh, email great. from Phil and Sarah oh, an hour seriously? ago. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. Clive is delighted to announce a new online store. It's just gone live and is now taking orders. So they got fulfilled through Threadless, the T-shirt company. There are T-shirts in a myriad of shapes and sizes as well as hoodies, kids wear, mugs, notebooks, bags, and more. So, yeah, one hour ago, Crap. guys. Well, we'll have to put that cool. into into our news episode, too. Yeah. So yeah. you're going to be listening to this out of order because the news episode is going to come first and then they this alien commentary <laughs> it's just the breaking news yeah i love the room where the captain is in with all those lights oh, yeah. blinking Mother around him. yeah, yeah. yeah. thinking room. about this as a 46 year old i would hate so much to be having to crawl through the through this uh shaft like he's doing mm-hmm. that would be so <laughs> painful to have to try you to know walk what's really like cool that. though is something that doesn't doesn't get mentioned often enough are the irising openings of the, yeah. tu- the tunnel. Yeah, mechanically, that cool. looks so difficult to, to pull off. We just it saw is. one. I mean, can you imagine, like, I've seen the one that they used on the Nautilus for, you know, the window has an a irising opening like that on the, the Nautilus yeah. from the Disney Nautilus. The, it's ginormous. There's a huge yeah. round frame off to the edges with, that you don't see, and that's the way that this thing works, is it's a big mechanical, you know, hinged, greased. It's all greased. <laughs> you see how it kind of slides together, you know? Iris hatches make me uneasy. Because I feel like someone's going to get bisected by that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Not only that, but it's something that's been in science fiction books. Like you'd read a science fiction story and uh-huh. they would talk about the hatch iris open. You know, yes. it's, it uh, sounds sci fi, you know. That's true. That is true. Um, so this movie's original cut, when Ridley Scott was done, I think it was over like three and something hours. And uh, then they just cut it down to two. Four. It was four. It was, wow. was it four? Yeah. Four hours. Imagine that. Uh, um, probably a lot of them um, jabbering at the table and stuff. Well, they thought it was slow, slow pace. Yeah. Like when they're searching in the hallways, that took a lot longer. Yeah. So when I saw this movie the first time on TV, I actually remember just not thinking it was slow at all. I remember just being completely enthralled by the on movie. The edge yeah, of your seat. yeah, yeah, yeah. In Portugal, we call it "Alien: The Eighth Passenger." So oh, that's yeah, oh, that's that. a subtitle. Of of the movie, the eighth passenger, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, because it is the eighth passenger, uh-huh. all the and way until is... he's the third passenger. Right, <laughs> ten little Indians. <laughs> yeah, I like that you counted Jonesy in there. Yeah, <laughs> good old Jonesy. What, what's weird is Jones doesn't show up until like late in the movie. I that that's kind of a weird thing to me. It's like you think he would have woken up with them in the. Oh yeah, he's there at their first breakfast. You just Is don't he? realize he's yeah yeah he's sitting right on the table with them. Oh he man, how did I miss that? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I just watched this last we're, night we're, too. <laughs> I think the motion this movie so many times. Yeah. <laughs> so have the I. motion I tracker mean, is such a cool invention for the story because yeah. it just really adds to the tension of them getting that little beep. It, it, I love it's just, the sound it makes. It's perfect. <laughs> And it's funny, I, yeah. I grew up watching Laserdiscs, and, and so I know in every movie that I watched all the time where the spot that, that you have to turn the Laserdisc over. So uh-huh. in, in Alien, it was when Brett got hauled up in the air, and then... Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, <laughs> then, then it went black, and I'd have to get up and go turn over the Laserdisc. Oh, that kind of breaks the pace of the movie. <laughs> well, it Gives you uh, a place to go take a bathroom break. No, it's, right. nost- it's nostalgic for me, though. I still remember uh, uh, DVDs that you had to flip over too. They, that you know, only happened props. a really short time when they did that, yeah. though. Like I, yeah, I think um, Stargate was like that. Mm-hmm. You know those props, the the uh, tracker and the uh, cattle prod and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Guess who has those? <laughs> really, Bob Burns. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna. Th- I was. I was gonna say. Do you have? The- I thought you were gonna say you had them. No, but I know guys that have built replicas with Bob Burns' help. Bob yeah. Burns has been so useful, so helpful for all the fans. Like, sure. I know people that own an exact duplicate, like 
you know, Adam Savage has an exact duplicate of the alien spacesuits that they oh, wear when they cool. walk around on the planet. And a buddy of mine who lives just, you know, right here in town, he's got one too. We've done alien displays. He, with his alien suits and costumes, he's got like Ash's costume, Dallas's costume, Ripley's costume. Mm, he puts wow. them on mannequins. And I put my alien monsters and face huggers and eggs on display. You know? Here we go. I'm not drawing any straws. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm killing that goddamn thing right the, now. Since this is part of the chapter F for flesh, uh, we have to talk about the, the part, the body horror part, right? Because oh, yes. the thing about Alien, and now I know we're in the part that's more like the slasher movie where they're all being picked out one by one. Right. Ten little Indians, but, one by one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the, oh, there it is. I, I like it how they just flip the, the the light and then all of a sudden he's like, boo! He just lifts up his little arms and you see uh, the alien at the bottom of the tunnel. But, um, so, the body horror That's a great part, right? jump scare. That's a great jump scare. The idea of having a parasite or having something inside you, something that takes you over from the inside. Yeah. And this movie has that part where I attach it a lot to movies like The Thing, uh, which is another movie about or an Cronenberg. alien. Cronenberg. Anything yeah. Cronenberg. Yeah, right? Like, um, you know, I'm trying to think about a movie by Cronenberg, like uh, Scanners, Shivers. Shivers. Yeah. You know, uh, well, and Videodrome. It, and it's the, it's the horror of... of pregnancy too right i mean if uh, rape it's yeah. rape yeah yeah exactly it's that's what uh, uh shushet said to uh, dan o'bannon they were trying to figure out how this alien was going to show up and then i think it was shushet said to dan o'bannon the alien screws one of these people i was like what <laughs> Yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna he's gonna be an egg. He's gonna attach to the face. He's gonna put this thing down the throat and deposit an egg, and, uh, and that's <laughs> wow. how they came up with the idea. And they was like, oh yeah, and basically oh. the best thing that they liked from the original script, the the, the executives was this section where there's a chestburster scene. That was the right. part that impressed the most people. Right, like they were reading the script and they would literally say, "This is a, this is a terrible script," but there's yeah. one scene in there that you got to read, you know. Yeah. And when they were playing this um, at the Egyptian theater at the premiere, um, the the Egyptian theater played it on a loop for 48 hours. And during those 48 hours, the line of people trying to get into the cinema was going around the block. And it and, never stopped. <laughs> and Dan O'Bannon, the, the, the writer of the original story, was kind of pissed off at the way he had been treated, like you said at the beginning, mm -hmm. that they didn't let him watch dailies and that they changed his script. And they, they made a script saying based on Dan O'Bannon's story. but a script Right, they by tried Walter to cut Hill. his credit out. Yeah. yeah. And so he was driving around Los Angeles and he's like pissed off. He's like, I'm not going to watch the movie. I'm not going to go there. And then it was like seven o'clock. He decided to, I think he might've been drunk. And he was like, he seven o'clock, he twisted the car around, went down to Hollywood, went to the Egyptian theater and he saw all these people lying around the, the block. Right. And so he started walking like over the, he started walking the line and it was like, huh, what's going on? Is this the entire movie? line. <laughs> yeah. And he got to the, the place where you go into the theater and the producers were there and like, Hey, hey, Stan, come on, Dan, let's, let's get you inside and let's watch a movie. And apparently he was just kind of in the daze and he just sat down and he watched the people watch the movie and he started sobbing in his seat. Oh, yes. Cause he was just yeah. so he impressed. He cried through the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Tears just running down his cheeks. And it was so funny because Ron Shushit, his buddy, he was sitting right behind him. You know, yeah. he's like, Dan, Dan, are you okay? You know, he's like, yeah. You know, and the reason why that was such a, a traumatic thing for him was because when he went to see the original screening of Dark Star, it was a terrible experience. Nobody came no. to see it, you know, and nobody laughed. It was a comedy and he was, you know, in it. He starred in it and he yeah. was trying to be funny. And it, I laugh. I think it's funny. But, you know, he had a terrible experience. So he never wanted to go see a premiere again. Here we are, the moment where Ripley confronts Mother, the computer, and finds out the uh, the hidden orders. The truth. The truth. Well, that's weird because I already finished that part. And oh, now, now she's yeah. now she's getting in an argument with Ash, and he's you know when he's going to go crazy. Ash that is, is so strange. I think we're watching different versions. I, I, I'm not sure if if this is the actual version that you're watching, but well, you, I don't know. You said you were doing the 2003 director's cut, right? I'm watching a director's cut, yeah. Well, there's only one. Know. Yeah. 
Oh, Special well. Order 937, Science yeah. Officer Eyes Only. And, you know, one of the things that's a real trope in these movies is that anytime someone's looking at a computer screen, they project the letters onto the person's face. That never happens that way. In real life, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just such a trope. And You know what's uh, weird, too, though, here in this scene is how the hell did Ash get in here? And why didn't the door go like it did when she came in? Yeah, yeah. Wind, you know, right. That, that was like a that, that was like a horror movie thing where if you're... If if, if it's somebody's like, yeah, off as camera, as the camera can't see it. Yeah, they you, can, <laughs> it, it can sneak up on someone. Yeah, any, anything could be off camera there. And right. he's sitting right next to her. Yeah, so it's the old it's trope like, of. All of a sudden, it's like, yeah. whoa, yeah, Ash, what the hell are you doing in here? How'd you get <laughs> yeah. in here? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I love it's this little... for you know the captain only in there. You know, yeah, and, and Ash's mask is completely fallen. The human mask is completely fallen. His face is absolutely expressionless and cold. But it's and he it's also a milk sweat. Yeah, and his 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 uh, glitches are so weird. You know, it's like <laughs> it, 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 I think even at this well, I, I'm at the point where he's rolling up the magazine right now. Right but, now, what do you think that's for? I mean, Ridley said something in one of the documentaries that said something about Ash or the robots or humanoid robots or whatever having sex. You know, like being horny or whatever. Is that a dildo? Is that a a phallic object? You know? I hmm. I just figured he's that his that he lost his mind. Yeah, I mean, I thought he just went crazy and and uh, he, he can't think straight anymore. I I think he's an asphyxiator. By he's in overdrive, right? Yeah. He's going into overdrive. And uh, although think about it, when they kill, when an alien kills you, like when it kills you up at Kodo, it slams that inner tongue into your face, yeah. either in your forehead or you know yeah. could go into your mouth or whatever. I think he's going to shove that in her mouth and choke her and kill her. But yeah. maybe it'll be to make it look like the alien did it. Uh, hmm. I think at this point, if he killed her, he would just kill the rest of the crew. Yeah. It would be crew expendable, you know? Right, but yeah. when they come into the room and they find her like that, you know, maybe he'd be able to pass it off as like, oh, the alien must have got her or whatever, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he could just hide the proof of what he did, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but, but I always I thought think that's an odd thing to do, to roll up a magazine and use it as a weapon, you know? The, yeah. conflict, the conflict that we see inside Ash might have something to do with the fact that if you think about it, uh, Asimov's three rules of robotics, right? It's always that the the robots can't hurt a human. Yeah. So that would be programmed into them. So I feel like Right, but not these. These are not programmed that way. Yeah, yeah, but I feel like he might be like there might be a convergence of orders inside his system and that's why he's just going, going so crazy. Big. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the fact that there's porn <laughs> posters glued to the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who's whose little cabin do you think that is? Is it Brett's? This is this is Could Parker be. and Brett and all them. They stick up porn and stuff because do you remember yeah. during the eating scene and they said to Lambert like eh, I'd like to be eating something else, you know? And she yeah. kind of gets shy and looks away and stuff. But you know that was a sexual reference. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. And and in terms of that sexual reference, you also have the porn there, the magazine yep, rolled up, yep. the, yeah. the, the kind of weird sexual tension between – oh, here we go. Everybody. So Dallas the, and, and Ripley were supposed to be lovers also. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, you didn't know that? Yeah, no. It's in the, it's in the novel. Because I knew they that – the sex in the shuttle, I think. Yeah, in the novel. But in the script, they were all written to be uh, – Male, possibly. Male, male and interchangeably with female. Oh, this section – the usher at the Egyptian theater fainted at, at this particular scene. Right. <laughs> oh. Wait, is this with the with his head getting head? Okay. Ash is a goddamn the head robot. Being, yeah. the head being ripped off. Yeah. I love that line. Ash is a goddamn robot. Yeah. <laughs> And but you know what's you weird know, is that Ridley tries to connect these robots with term, you know, um, you know, and and uh, James Cameron tries to connect them with Terminator robots and you know androids like Bishop and you know James Cameron with the new you know the uh, the new movie the Prometheus robot you know and yeah. so they're all connected under the skin you know supposedly well, like with replicants from Blade Runner and everything. Yeah. The strange part of the them not knowing Ash is a robot is that it seems like in the later movies, they make it so that it's habitual for crews to have at least one synthetic on board. Yeah. Right. So the fact that they didn't know that he was a robot is... Uh, they hadn't kind of, started doing that yet. Yeah. But yeah, yeah was, this was, was 50 years time. before Aliens, right? Or 54 right. years, I think. Right. True, true. Yeah. And also, I think it's a military you know, vehicle would always have a robot, but not necessarily a commercial 
you know, totally, cargo ship. Yeah. And that kind of, it's weird that in Cameron's movie, you never get the opportunity to not think that Bishop is not a robot because they do that thing with a right. knife on the, on right the table. Off, yeah. Right. right off like, the bat. It's like, tick, tick, he's doing that thing. It's like, oh. Yeah, and he always gives everybody his, their cornbread because he doesn't eat, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then they make real sure to show that he cuts himself just a little bit so the white milk the white comes blood. out. Yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, Ripley so jumps up Weaver. out of her seat. Yeah. yeah. I love stuff like that. Oh my God. <laughs> it was nice to turn that around and make Bishop a hero, you know. And yes, yes. I thought I like that, that was cool. I like the mechanism inside Ash. It's just these bubbles and wires. Yeah. Well, it's fiber optics. You right. know how yeah. the fiber right. optics look at the end, you know, of yeah. it's, it's yeah, clear and, strand. And for that uh, that video, that uh, 20 facts about Alien, for them to say that, that he's like a replicant, I don't think so. I mean, replicants... No, Ridley Scott says so, too. But rep- replicants are so similar to humans that you have to yeah. do a personality test to figure out if... I mean, you could just they x-ray... Have biological you, organs and everything. You could just x-ray right. this guy, and you would know right away that he's not a human. Right. right, but you don't. You're not taking into consideration what really himself is saying about all this. Yeah, well, Ridley didn't even read Bla- the "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep" before he made Blade Runner. Right, but see, he made the movie. So now, if we're going from you know, it's like you know, uh, the Hellbound Heart versus Hellraiser. It's like once you make a movie, now okay, the movie is the only thing you go by when it comes to movies. Yeah, you know? but in the movie, they still had a personality test to figure out if people were replicants or not. Right. The only way you could tell would be if you got a, a tissue sample, and then you'd see the serial number with an electronic microscope in a cell or something like that, because they had organs. They were like yeah. harvested humans. Right. The whole right. thing about replicants is that it's mostly a question of slavery, you know, because you'd yeah. be making artificial. Yeah. What people. is human? When, yeah. when are yeah. you human? Exactly. They weren't. They weren't so much androids, even though the original script of Blade Runner was about making them more mechanical. Like, the opening of uh, Blade Runner 2049 has Batista be in the hut in the middle of nowhere, and then, yeah. you know, Ryan yeah, Gosling a, comes down. Yeah. yeah, and he comes down, and he, he sees a, a pot bubbling, and then the guy comes in, and they fight. That was the actual opening of the original Blade the Runner original, script. original, yeah. Hampton yeah. Foucher. And then, and then at the script. end, the guy would kill uh, the android, and he would take out the the chin, the jaw of the android, and it would be a exactly. mechanical See, shiny them. thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. but then of course, for the actual Blade Runner movie, they made them more like humans. They made right. them, you know, biological, you know, replicants. Yeah, right. So, but let's goodbye, get back Ash. To Alien. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Goodbye, so, Ash. Anyways, I was just going to tell you more about my collection. I have a huge alien collection, and one of the things that I've done over the years is make these alien haunted houses, and one of the first ones we did was alien, just alien. Then later we started doing aliens because mm-hmm. yeah. you know they made an alien haunted house in England called Alien War. Did you guys ever hear of that? No. No, I didn't. No, can't say I have. A professional haunted house done one in Scotland and one in England, like in the Fisherman's Wharf area. and. Hmm. They had all the original. It was from Alien Two. They had all the original costumes and models and props and you know all the armor of the Colonial Marines and stuff. And then I imitated all that and did that myself at a haunted house wow. here in California. And I played the chestburster on opening night. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> and what I did was uh, the um, the mannequin. I I would come up to a mannequin that was mounted in the wall. Yeah, we made a so, foam body duplicate so with a big hole in the chest. A headless yeah. mannequin, and you you press your you press your neck and chin up at the edge of the headless mannequin. Oh. It had one arm, and then uh-huh. you use that arm like it had a right arm. So I had a flashlight alien. Remember, Ed, the alien yeah, had yeah. a flashlight in it so that you could see it a little bit in the dark to scare the audience. And so with my free arm, so I put one arm through the wall so that I can struggle and shake my arm and look like and I'm suffering. Look like she's going, <laughs> and she oh, put wow. a mouthful of blood. We'd have blood backstage. So you'd yeah, get a, a mouthful cup, of blood. Yeah, a little cup of, uh, of fake blood. And so then I'd push the the, fa- the chest burster through the hole of my chest, the mannequin fake chest, chest. <laughs> with the flashlight on and scare the heck out of the audience. And then Oh, As he's going, no way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So it was a puppet? The the chest burster was a yes. puppet? Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. 
I and found... we also had colonial marines and they would have lights on their helmets and lights on their guns. We had pulse rifles that had speakers and sound effects in the walls and in the guns. And, and they did you have like dry her. ice smoke and stuff yes, like that? Yes, and we, they would come up to her and lift her chin up with the gun and then she would go, kill me, yes. kill me, and, and <laughs> spaz out, you know. <laughs> wow. I found an article about Alien War, uh, tagline, the longest 20 minutes of your life. (laughs) Yeah, the queue is longer than the ride. (laughs) Created by John Gorman and Gary Gillies. It opened in the Arches venue in Glasgow in April 92. Yeah, Amazing. they actually had Sigourney Weaver and, you know, actually had, you know, Bishop, you know, Lance Hendrick and stuff come to the opening of it and stuff. How awesome. So did you get to uh, work with Gary Gillies and John Gorman? No, I did my own version here in California. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I built my own interior of the Nostromo with pipes and tubes and all that stuff. We did a med lab. We did, you know, the cocooned victims. We have pictures of all this. We'll, we'll send you pictures. Yeah, send us pictures. So Was I'm, that in San Francisco? Uh, actually, over Pleasanton. Pleasanton, California. near. Pleasanton, we have California. a big fairgrounds here. It was on the okay. fairgrounds. Uh, I, I'm on the scene where uh, the alien is coming after Lambert now, and and uh, I love the scene where she's grabbing all the the coolant, and she looks back and kind of sees it, and then she has to, and she's grabbing more coolant, and she's like, "Wait a minute!" And she looks a second. Yeah, there's a shadow. She does a wall. double take. Yeah, it's so cool. Uh-huh. It's like that's as so see, that's so the realistic. Starts creeping up the wall, and she notices the moving shadow, yeah. and when yeah. she turns around, she sees it there. Yeah. I love the costumes and the way that they have kind of like a, a lace up. Uh, yeah, laces are on a lot of things. Yeah, right. Yeah, on spacesuits, on jackets, on yeah. jumpsuits. You know, like Ripley's got They're a like lace kind of a corset thing, in, thing, thing in the back. Yeah, yeah. like a corset. Yeah. I think it's because airline. You know, when you go up in zero g, they would corset you in. Right. Zero g. Right. So you can do the whole like. Um, uh, so hold your kid diaphragm, yeah. diaphragm exercises or whatever when you're going through G forces, right? Man, yeah, and poor Parker, and he, he the, the last thing he yelled is, is "Get out of the room," which I never quite understood, but now I've got subtitles. He says, "Get on. out of the way." He's like, "Get out of the way." He wants to use the <laughs> no, no, well, when, no. The I'm talking about when he's when he's gra- he's grappling with the alien. He says, "Get out of the room." Because he's oh, telling yeah. her, it, you know, you, now is your chance yeah, to escape. In other words, I'm dead. Get away while yeah. I'm being killed. You know, yeah, run. yeah, so cool. But you know what else is happening is the tail of the alien has a big hook spike on it. Yeah. It's going between her legs. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because the, the, all again. those horrible sounds she makes when she dies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it's over the, the sound system. Yeah, so that part that you were talking about, Ryan, reminds me of the part in Alien 3 when Dylan, uh, played by Charles S. Dutton, yeah, tells yeah. Ripley to get out of the trap uh, and he's going to fight the alien by himself. Yeah. Yep, yep, one-on-one. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about Yapakoto's telling Ridley that on the day that he was supposed to die, <laughs> he, he, he was always coming up with ideas and changing things and using, you know, ad libs and stuff. Well, he told Ridley on that day, he goes like, I'm not going to die. I'm going to fight the alien. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to win. It's not going to kill me. <laughs> that would be something, I tell yeah. you. Well, I mean, that's fine for his, you know, attitude in the acting His character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those like tubes in the back of the alien, I think, were Rolls Royce parts. Oh wow! What's that? The pipes? Yeah. No, no, those are sculptures. The um, the Rolls Royce pipe parts. He Giger didn't get to use um, the motors and things like that. He wanted to use those on the planet surface stuff. Oh, oh, so I thought he said something about and, using that in the alien, but uh, no, I guess I must yeah, have misheard. Look, I know that alien backwards and forwards. I yeah. have remade that thing from scratch myself multiple times, wow. <laughs> and I've got all the molds to prove it. <laughs> so and there you go. Tiny mouth. At least that. Uh, at least there's no chance that anybody could accidentally set off the self-destruct sequence on the. On yeah, the, look at how difficult stroma. it is to yeah. get it to work. Well, and there's then, the part and, where and the then trying tail to turn it off. Lambert's legs. Yeah, mother, yeah. you bitch. Yeah. <laughs> The automatic self-destruct system will detonate in three seconds or three minutes. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 are, yeah, it's ten minutes. It's a ten-minute countdown, but then it's five minutes 
before you can over, you know, and then you can't override, yeah, override it anymore. It. Well, it's like in Alien Two, right? When they're the uh, the nucleus is going to melt down, and there's a countdown to the meltdown. Like, right. It right. doesn't work that way. It's not. It's <laughs> probably not going to be as precise as they think. It's just it is. an artifice for introducing tension into the movie, and exactly. it's like, oh, five, four, three, two, one, kaboom! Yeah, <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, but you know what's great is how you know when the tension's all high and it's all sweaty. They've turned off the coolant. You know, she's screaming, "Mother, put back on the cooling units!" Yeah, because you know, it's getting so hot and stuffy and everything. She has to, you know pin up her hair and she's goes back for the cat yeah. you know she could have been safe she could have gotten the shuttle and closed the door so but now I, now i'm cat. at the part where she's finding the cocoons with uh, dallas and and uh oh and brett oh she's going down a, a trap door right now for okay. me she's looking at the emergency destruction system actually but oh, wow. um there's a part in the documentary of the making of where the cinematographer was talking about this, the part where Ripley goes to catch Jonesy and put him inside a, a thing and the rescue cat him. Cat carrier. Yeah, the cat carrier. Cat carrier. <laughs> that someone in the screening, like uh, an African American voice, yelled, Leave the fucking cat. Just get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he was like, Yeah, that's, that's really cool. The audience is getting so engaged into the movie. Yeah. And all these weird little secretions and things, you know, and sculptures that the alien made, like... KY jelly. Yeah. It's just a, how how can it, you know, where does it get the material from? Are you talking about the resin that's secreted to create the cocoon of yeah, um, Brett yeah. and Parker? Yeah. yeah, it's like that's in the natural secretion that they make, like all that slime that comes yeah. out of the mouth and stuff. Yeah. Imagine that would harden, you know? And yeah, they can they can sculpt it. So there was an architecture to the alien culture as well, apparently. Yeah. Yeah, their 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 intelligence is something interesting to think about too. Like They're like worker ants. Yeah, yeah. Their intelligence is, is so different from ours, but uh they're smart. They're hive ways. mind. Yeah. They have a hive mind. Well, they do by aliens, they definitely do. I don't know about this one. Well, if you know, the stuff we don't get to see in this movie like that. You know, that uh, hieroglyphic design that Giger, mm-hmm. Giger made for the whole, you know, life cycle from egg to adult, you know, and everything. Yeah. I would, would like to study that, you know, like it, yeah. if, if you were to look at that, you know, to see if that gives you any ideas about, you know, is there a hive or, you know, what's the deal? Yeah. Man, these tunnels are amazing. Like just the amount of detail in these tunnels is just crazy. Yeah. The only thing I think wouldn't work for a spaceship like this is because all these different nooks and crannies and, and, and cracks and stuff, it would be so hard to clean, to keep it clean, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not to mention who would care? You know, it's like when you're in a greasy, you know, truck stop and stuff, you know, who cares to clean all that? You know? Good point. Oh, and here's, I'm, I'm at the part where he's looking at the cat, the alien is, and he just like hits it with his hand and knocks it. I like that, that the alien is examining the cat almost like, what is this? Yeah. You know, these humans keep this in this cage, you know, this, yeah. why do they do this, you know? And then he's like, cage. oh, this, this thing is useless to me and hits it. Right. Yeah. The yeah. alien's looking at the cat like, did they trap you in here too? <laughs> yeah. It only has one ass. It's of no use to me. Can I eat it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen the video of the cat fighting a crocodile, just whacking a crocodile in the face? And no. Oh, there's, yeah. there's a video of a crocodile coming in to eat some chicken wings that someone put next like to, in like Florida a zoo. Or something? Yeah. And then the cat's <laughs> chewing on the the turkey necks or whatever chicken wings or whatever they are. And the crocodile comes over to eat that, and the cat just kind of hisses at the crocodile. <laughs> Wax him a couple of times, and the crocodile just kind of stumbles backwards and goes back in the water. <laughs> so it's just amazing. That's a tough cat, man. I would imagine <laughs> Jonesy doing the same to the alien, just whacking him across the face, and the alien going like, "Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> sniff at this thing anymore." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what's interesting too about this whole thing with the toward the end of the movie when you know she gets in the spacesuit and everything and you know originally you remember this part in the commentary and documentaries and stuff they talked about that she was going to be naked yeah originally. Mm-hmm. 
completely naked. And yeah. that the, you know, I, I see the vulnerability. I understand, you know, her being in her panties and, and you know, t little tank top and stuff, you know, sneaking into the, you know, getting undressed once she's safe, you know, pinning up her hair. I think know. that works better because I don't think it would make much sense for her not to wear some sort of undergarments. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Ridley, they, the, on that one that uh, I sent to you about the 10 things, you know, yeah. the girl says something like, oh, Ridley's a pervert or something like that. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, you know, as a movie maker, he's thinking about the audience and what would make the audience tick. And uh, yeah. I think that would be they wouldn't not, get away not with perverted, but anything. not perverted. But I just think that would be gratuitous. Well, I don't think a, a part of that was that the anyway. alien was supposed <laughs> to get aroused by her and like touch itself. Yes, like yeah, that. what? that's what she said yeah, in that that yeah. twenty facts you didn't that's know about right. Alien, which oh, I, that I sounds want, terrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how how could that work in the movie? I don't. It's yeah. it's like someone touching themselves, looking at a, an octopus or an alien animal of some sort. Yeah. That doesn't work that way. <laughs> that would be stupid. <laughs> Although there are but, probably people who touch themselves looking at octopuses for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's interesting is you know they only made Japan. three of those spacesuits, so except for the little ones. But so this one was just one of those other spacesuits painted white, you know, repainted. Oh, for this scene, you know. There's and, a great uh, uh, making of book that came out about the making of Alien, so uh, I do recommend that. Oh yeah, I've got tons of them. I've got the the uh, Alien storybook, which is like still photos of the entire film, like a like a frame by frame, you know, page by page, the whole story in photos, and uh, you know, several other books, like of course Giger's Necronomicon and oh, and Giger's, like Giger's, Alien. Giger's Alien too. Yeah, and Giger's Alien. Yeah. The the thing about watching this in Blu-ray is that you can see details that you've never seen before in the props, right, right. and some of them do look. Like easier. Ama- amazing work. I mean, amazing paint job on these like flamethrowers and, and motion detectors. But at the same time, it looks like it's something that someone just painted, you know. Right. Uh, and and you see the cracks in the padded walls, the the, yep. the, the paint yep. cracking. Because they, yeah. they painted them. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And a lot of things, Ridley, he's famous in Legend also, he did this, or in Blade Runner too. He throws glitter all over things, like down in the underground, I mean, in the below deck scenes with the chains and, you know, the, the there's these little weird vehicles and stuff down underground, and, I mean, down under the decks area. And it's all dark and black and, you know, he would just paint things gold and throw glitter in, on them because with lighting, it caught the edges of metal and it just made things look interesting you know he he didn't care if it made sense as long as it looked cool and interesting wait who was firing the flamethrower i heard down the hallway was that just a um, ship blowing up no the ship, yeah, yeah the ship was overheating okay right. gotcha it's it's um, weird to think that like tony gas, scott gas and is, Rid- ridley scott are invented, so you know are so different from each other like tony scott directed uh top gun I did an article on the making of Top Gun for Cinefix magazine, and I interviewed Tony Scott. And oh, really? Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, he committed suicide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he yeah, had I brain cancer or something like that? Top Gun. Apparently, yeah, yeah, supposedly. So he received the Narcissus separating from the Nostromo. Yeah. Do you guys think that Jonesy was an artifice of the story to make it like the sequel would have an alien hiding in the cat. Cause we see the alien look at the cat. And no, then... I don't think so. I don't think they ever intended for a sequel. This was a one shot film. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I want to make one quick comment. Have you, are you guys familiar with the earlier, you know, uh, low budget sci-fi fifties film called, um, uh, Oh, I'm going blank on the name right now. Um, describe uh, it. Uh, it's the one that has a dead alien skeletal, creature also and mm. oh it the terror from beyond space are you mm, familiar with that film no it the terror it sounds from beyond familiar space. to me it's a rubber monster suit and bob burns actually owns the original monster suit left over from that and ray crash corrigan the old stunt guy and cowboy actor he's in the monster suit but anyways the monster is going deck by deck through like a pointed rocket ship with fins that landed on a planet. And, you know, it gets inside the ship and gets on board and it starts coming up deck by deck, trying to get them and kill them, you know, just like in alien. So a lot of people who've seen this movie, it, the terror from beyond space, compare it to the basic plot of alien with going to an alien planet, discovering an artifact, you know, a dead alien, you know, skeletal creature, you know, all, 
all that stuff, you know, a lot of it is in this it, the terror from beyond space, along with the fact that the monster is a rubber man in a suit and it's killing the, the crew, you know, one by one, you know. Huh. So the Nostromo just exploded along with whatever stuff they were taking to be refined, uh, maybe uh, some sort of fuels or some sort of uh, minerals. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like and how many billions and billions of, of dollars was yeah. that worth? You know, yeah. <laughs> in in adjusted dollars, as they yeah. say. In two, it in does yeah. come up in the later movies, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. They can build but, uh, one of, Yeah. One of the cool things about how they shot that ending sequence was they built the Nostromo's rear engine, you know, the four engine holes in the, you know, the jets of the engine. And they mounted that upside down up on the ceiling of the studio. And then mm. they had wire rig and the actor, you know, stuntman, you know, in a harness with the alien costume on. And he is bouncing around at the back of the ship, you know, and they fire, you know, she hits the engines and fires the rockets, you know, blasting him. And they did that with water. They had, you know, bright lights up behind, you know, the the water, and the water all cascaded down on the alien guy in the suit, you know, in the back of the ship. So when you see that alien spinning around in space after she ejects him out of the, the inside of the shuttle, you know, that's how they did that with a full suit and a guy, you know. I that love here. Is so chill. I, I'm, I'm right now. She's in her underwear, and you can see those pipes that are shaped like the alien head, and then the alien head like in between them. Yeah, it's so it's cool because you popping out. Yeah, and <laughs> and you you would never know that that was you know until the hand pops out. You would never notice that. Right, and what's interesting so perfectly about the, camouflaged. Yeah, what's interesting about the hand design? Look at it; it's got six fingers, and yeah. you could use one mold for both right and left. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I did that. I mean, I have a right. I mean, I have a one hand, you know, for the first movie's Alien, mm -hmm. and then in the second movie, they changed the hand. The hand is no longer six fingered with clear fingernails, and you know, it, it's a completely different sculpture for the second oh. movie. That's but I have, I, I have both. I have both. That's the part where I crushed hard on Sigourney Weaver right there. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. The panties. <laughs> They're really blow cut panties. Right. Yep. Bikinis. <laughs> no. It's just a little string on the side. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, the way the head is just hiding there, it looks like just another piece of piping. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The head of the alien. So it looks so more cool. opaque in, in those scenes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, so you know, did, did you been, guys have the scene with the with the cocoon in Dallas and stuff? I don't think I did, which is really weird. So uh, you're not so you're watching the theatrical cut then? I think I am. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. I think we are too because we. I don't think did Nina. Did you see the cocoon? No, no, it wasn't there. No. Also, okay. you know, one other thing about you know this. She's getting into the spacesuit now, or about to get into the spacesuit in our yeah. version. Okay. Yes. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask Nina about, you know, like we hear a lot these days about, you know, like feminism in films, you know, like how, you know, Captain Marvel, you know, the new female Captain Marvel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me let me handle this from a woman's perspective. Uh, if you ask uh, some women uh, in this their, is 41 their, years okay, ago, I'm, 41 listen, years I'm, ago. <laughs> I'm 55. I, I don't mind admitting it. I'm 55. But if you ask a woman in her 30s, they think. They're under this mistaken impression that people don't like strong female characters. Or and, that men, the man babies don't. You know, yeah. yeah. But the, the truth is that Ripley was immediately loved and respected. Immediately. Yeah. She was in, in, people embraced her immediately. There was yeah. no oh, yeah. there was no ifs, ands, or buts. They, they well, really and, embraced and her. And originally the, they they had not they would wanted uh, Ripley to be a male character because they didn't want to do what Halloween had just done the year before as having like a lone woman female survivor. But I guess right. and look at the connection with Dan O'Bannon and John Carpenter. Dan O'Bannon yeah. was fully aware of the yeah. final girl thing, you know? Yeah. Which, you know, I guess before Halloween I can't really think of too much, you know, where that happened, but but uh there but, were there were there were others, but you know, Sigourney ahead. Weaver was such a great actor that, you know, they that uh she, she got the part. This scene yeah, was, really, really impressed me so much that uh, about the lucky eight star. years ago, yeah, 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 eight years ago, I did what's called a, a ropes course. Have you ever heard of that? Where you climb a tree and you, you shimmy across ropes in different patterns and you weave oh, wow. tasks. So you're way up high. You're like you have to wear a harness. Feet. Yeah, you're up 30 feet in the air. You know? 
Right. So you wear a harness. So I had to do this thing where you have to go out onto the rope until you can't go any further and you're going to fall. So mm-hmm. you're, you're going to fall. The branch you, is right. so small. You know? Well, no, you have a partner, and you and your partner go out in the shape of a V, and as the V gets wider, you're holding each other's hands, and you're each shimmy, oh, shimmying wow. on a different wire until you fall, until you can't hold each other anymore. And I was singing, lucky, 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 <laughs> lucky. And the other woman didn't know why I was doing that. And so yeah. we both got back My down to the ground. She was like, why were you saying lucky, lucky, lucky? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Dorney Weaver. That's, yeah. that's a great, great memory there. <laughs> Wonderful. And also, you know, just the fact that this is, you know, along with, you know, in Terminator, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, Sarah Connor is also yeah. a very strong female character. They've been doing it for decades. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. We've had tons of strong female characters. It's not, you know, the... The patriarchy, you know. Remember well, Betty Davis? I've seen, I've <laughs> seen that counter a argument that. a lot, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually say that, like, oh, Captain Marvel was the first strong female character. And they tried to. I haven't. Yeah. The strobe lighting in this scene um, gives it such a otherworldly effect. Right. The strobe lighting, oh, yeah. because it makes they're already moving slowly, but the strobe lighting makes things move a little weirder, surreal. like there's frames surreal. missing. Yeah, it's surreal. I think also they intended it to be that the strobe light is, I think, supposed to be a time lapse camera that t- takes pictures of what's going on in the cabin of the ship. You know, when you go into suspended animation. So it's like a, you know, like a video monitor. Well, that's know, interesting. Things. Yeah. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of why it go. And you know, and the alien slow-wise. is being so slow. It almost looks like it's biding its time. Like it sees that she's in the spaceship with him, but it's like, yeah, but you know, I've handled everybody else. Yeah, You're not wh- going to be a problem. What, what can she? And do? look at how vulnerable yeah. she is. And it's like she's I, so I love that. It's like, oh, here's a way I can get in, and it goes into the engine there. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> tries to. <laughs> yeah. So she blasts it. Yeah. But see, that's what I was talking about. That was done with water, and the engines are hanging up on the ceiling of the studio, and the, the harness and the wires that are holding the guy in the alien yeah. suit are are through the engine, you know, yeah. cowling there, you know? There's so much detail on the outside of that helmet. There's like yeah. almost like these very etched engravings yeah on like little, little the, runes or something it's something yeah. you never would have noticed before uh b- before high door. definition yeah boom a, she's she got so, so that's water yeah that that alien blood that's interesting well no what i was saying the water is the engines when they fire when the when she punches the engines and blasts him when he's out in space dangling yeah uh-huh. that cord you know um, yeah but the thing it's about the, the water being the, hit by a very strong light right yeah. from behind so it looks like the engine blast you know but it's actually water but uh, the helmets you're talking about those are mobius designs helmets yeah and if you look at the drawings they're exactly like that and those shoulder designs and stuff those are egyptian if you look at them closely my buddy has an exact copy of that full costume you know and so does Adam Savage. Adam Savage wore it at Comic Con on mm-hmm. the floor of the convention. Even though, they, can you imagine how hot that thing would be if oh, to yeah. wear those yeah. spacesuits? The actors had to wear these little fo- little smoke devices that would puff smoke out of the backpack to make it look like they're breathing, and that's expelling you know carbon dioxide out of their systems. You know, yeah, those helmets have to be open and have some sort of ventilation, little tiny fans blowing in there so they don't fog up and yep. and whatever. Yep. Yeah, there are pictures of the actors like um, Dallas and, you know, Veronica Cartwright, you know, Lambert, you know, sitting on director's chairs and the lower legs, like from the knee down to the ankle, they're wearing these big white tuck and roll pads. Those are uh, um, cricket pads for English cricket. And Mm. the hands, the gloves that the spacesuits have are hockey gloves. Big, if you ever look at hockey players, like the goalies and stuff, they have real big, thick gloves on. Padded, yeah, to to keep the puck from coming in. So I I like that she has that 100-yard stare while she's talking about the logo, the the log of Last Survivor of Nostromo. Last Survivor of the Nostromo. Just her and the kitty cats. And And, and it's uh, so sad when that that plays at the end of Alien 3, you know, because she died. Yeah, right. I know. 
<laughs> edited but by she Terry might Rollins. be coming back. Have you guys heard about the Blomkamp script that Neil Blomkamp and her were I did. working together? And that talk about that a little bit. Well, um, they were going to bring back Hicks and uh, and 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 Newt and stuff, right? They were gonna they were gonna make right, like they were gonna a, act like yeah. Alien Three never happened. Which I'm not I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. I I, I don't really like this sort of retcon of like retcon. let's throw away all these like, yeah. but you know. It's just I that like Alien Three. Yeah, yeah, I did too. I, like I think 3. I think they could do away with Alien Resurrection. I'd be fine with that. <laughs> I do have some stuff here about uh, 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 Clyde Barker's involvement with Alien Three. Um, if I could just, oh really? Yeah, if oh, I could just ahead. read some of the stuff. Let's see where did I put that. All right, so. Before Clive released Hellraiser, he had several meetings with David uh, Giller in London and L.A. where they talked about Alien 3. That's what it says about here. I, I'm not sure this is true because – I can't believe yeah, it before Hellraiser yeah, 1. Yeah, because yeah. The Aliens was like 89 or something. Or no, well, anyway, I'm going to continue yeah, reading this. This is from a blog okay. that has some some reference can, stuff right and other stuff that's not referenced. But it says here that Clive had meetings with David Geiler in London and L.A. where they talked about Alien 3. The idea was that he would write the script and perhaps direct. He was also approached about continuing the Friday the 13th series. So wow. At the time, Clive was busy and was not so happy about dealing with someone else's static picking, yeah. up, uh, picking up someone else's narrative. The the intellectual property. Yeah. yeah. The parameters on originality were fairly strict. As much as he thought that Alien and Aliens were excellent films, he wanted, uh, he wanted what he did to come from him since what he did best was to imagine. And Clive's problem with the aliens was that he could never get his head around was the fact that the aliens didn't seem terribly interesting to him. Essentially, there were machines, albeit organic ones. They were a tribe of mute, instinct-led devourers that were murderers and lived far too short a time. And this was so very far from what he did with monsters in his stories and films. So when he turned down the, uh, the job of writing the screenplay for Aliens 3, Clive's agent went mad at him, and he had never seen an agent in <laughs> such a state of mortal wow. panic as when he said no. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, wow. it would have brought I'm Clive glad he millions. Said no, because yeah. he's absolutely right. You know, why yeah. should he work on somebody else's intellectual property when he's got so many ideas? Yeah. It says soon he and the agent parted company, and uh, this is from an, a blog called Alien Explorations Blogspot dot com. Well, and he got <laughs> approached for all kinds of stuff, like the you know the Mummy remake was going to be Clive Barker and Mick Garris yeah. for a while, and right, right, and. Um, uh, a couple more things says the resulting film was not something that he really liked very much. He had met David Fincher to discuss the problems he had making the movie. The first thing was that that uh, that so much emotional commitment was thrown out of the window because the little girl Newt and Michael Bean's character Hicks were dead. were dead from the beginning of the film, and he yeah. didn't want that to happen because he wanted continuity, and he felt cheated being asked to begin again when he didn't want to. So he was just talking about uh, oh wow, David so Fincher's. David Fincher didn't want it to be like that. Then that's no, he was handed the script. He didn't write that, you know. Well, that script got rewritten like a hundred times too. Right, yeah, and here are some quote sources. Josh so this and stuff. This article is properly sourced. It says at the end, Clyde Barker, I turned down the job of writing the screenplay for Aliens 3. I think that I should be pursuing my own stuff. What I do best is imagine. I don't like the idea of picking up on somebody else's narrative. And this is from Talking Chair with Clive Barker by yeah. Douglas Winter uh, for Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone magazine, volume 7, number 2. And then I think Jonathan Ross asked Clyde Barker in a show once, said, you were offered, was it uh, Aliens 3? And Clive said, Aliens Aliens 3 was, well, that was certainly a possibility, yeah. So that was in a show with uh, Jonathan yeah. Ross. Um, and you, then what else did they do have? Do you guys here? remember seeing the theatrical trailer where it said, on Earth, everyone can hear you scream? Oh, that's for <laughs> Alien 3. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they trailer. Yeah, they, they never they, did go to Earth. Yeah, and they actually played that, you know, in theaters. Like, So they, right, they, uh, right. they had changed the... Well, that shows you how messed up David Geiler and Walter Hill and them are, because they're yeah. the ones that are responsible for that stuff. Yeah. You know? Uh, here's another quote from Clyde Barker about Alien 3. It says, The second thing was that I didn't understand the metaphysics of the piece. That is to say, all we have is this colony of bald monk prisoners with some pseudo-religion which we're not given any real insight into. The idea of them having no guns and gadgets was interesting, but that was never really developed. So I felt we were being teased with possibilities which were never then delivered. And Clive said this in the Aliens comic number 8 from 1993. Uh, an interview with Clive Barker. 
What I would yeah. like to have seen is yeah. Giger and Clyde Barker get together and come up with something because yeah. Giger had all these crazy ideas for weird scripts himself, like these creatures that were like an arm connected to a leg and that was it, you know? Yeah. And that was kind of like the body politic in a way, yeah. you know? <laughs> right, yeah. I'll add this blog post to the show notes because there's some good sources here about uh, Clyde Barker saying that he turned down the request to write and direct. And he says, uh, he's not my agent anymore when the the agent got freaked out. Uh, Well, he he also turned down Godzilla 1998 too. Uh, (laughs) Thank goodness. What was was the situation between Stephen King and Clyde with Silver Bullet and all that? Do you know much about that? Silver Bullet. Or, you know, what was it? Silver... Oh, Quicksilver Highway. Highway. Quicksilver Highway, yeah. Uh, That was only because Mick Garris was friends with both of them and talked them both into... So what was Clive's... Did he write a script for the the teleplay or whatever it was? It was just the adaptation of his short story, The Body Politic, uh, from the Books of Blood. And I I don't think think, he did the adaptation. I think Mick Garris wrote the whole script, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. And And then Clive did a cameo in a scene where he plays a surgeon. Yeah. Okay. And Stephen King, I think, has a cameo in there somewhere. Yeah, he's a uh, yeah. I'm not so sure. So, what was but... Stephen King's involvement with Quicksilver Highway, other than the, being the, in the, it? It was two short stories, uh, adaptations of two short stories, and one of them. Oh, was, so one was Clive's, and one was Stephen. Yeah, King's. Stephen King's was Chattering Teeth, which I haven't read okay. the story, but you know, we but we uh, we did an audio, it. a commentary for the. Yeah, you know, one of those wind up toys that is a yep, bunch of chattering, chattering teeth. teeth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the whole thing. It, it oh, eats people and. Yeah. There's a scene of it carrying a person in the desert, like dragging it. <laughs> weird. Yeah, it is crazy. weird. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Anyway. Cool. Well, F was I love flesh. Alien. I love Alien. Yeah. Alien was such a big influence. H.R. Giger's artwork has been – I'm not kidding. It is one of the biggest influences on my entire life. I mean, ever since the 70s when I first saw it, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, King Kong, of course, as well, monsters, makeup, all that stuff. But Alien, I mean, Nina is not kidding. We have so many model kits, so many toys. We have (laughs) plush face huggers, you know, plushy face huggers. We've got, I mean, just, I've got hats and gloves, you know, just tons of stuff. My house is filled with Alien memorabilia and model kits and toys and full-size monsters and everything (laughs) i even have an actual from the alien war thing that you found an actual full-size wearable costume from that that i paid over two thousand dollars for and there's an alien hatching inside your body as we speak yes (laughs) (laughs) oh no yeah come on the food ain't that bad (laughs) Man, you know, I just got this last quote from Clyde Barker about (laughs) aliens um, that he says, Superman is, after all, an alien life form. He is simply the acceptable face of invading realities. Uh, I guess Superman is on the other spectrum of the aliens. (laughs) Right. uh, Right. Side of the the spectrum. The beautiful alien. Beautiful (laughs) alien that comes to save us all. Yeah. Jesus alien. All right, that was F is for Flesh. What's coming up next, uh, Ryan? Another Giger, yes, inspired. Yeah, baby. yeah. So, and we had talked, I think we this was before we had started the episode, we had kind of debated about this, but I, it seems like we're kind of, and I wanted to get your opinions on this, but it seems like we're kind of, uh, we're kind of moving more towards species. Mm-hmm. That's fine with me. I okay. love species. I have Natasha a great Natasha Henstridge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And Alfred Molina, and who else is in there? Yeah, and I think I was people. saying before and that... Michael it, that, Madsen, or, yeah, Michael Madsen, right? I think I was saying before that it felt too much like a comedy, but I want to retract that and say I think instead what I mean is that it feels like it's too, it's meant to be too sexy, I think. Huh. Because yeah, sure. for, for, for a horror movie, her. yeah, yeah. Well, and she seduces every man, you know, that she right. runs into. Well, so that, I think that was her first film, too, and, you know, they found a beautiful actress to cast, yeah. you know. It's like the other side of the male. I don't. I don't even think we can put a gender on the alien that we just saw. Would Would you guys call this alien a male alien? I would. Yeah. Yeah. So this alien kind of rapes people into uh, duplicating submission, a submission. <laughs> yeah. and and the female alien species Sill would she seduce them, them into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. But what's weird is that there's a male. Like there's dream sequences where she's imagining a male Sill type character. You know, yeah. a male alien of her same race. You know. Yeah. yeah. And I love the dream, dream sequence sequences. that has the the train. 
You know, so, yeah. so you know, H.R. Yeah. Giger built a train like that that's big enough to sit on and ride in his backyard. Oh, God. Huh. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. A, haunted, yeah. a haunted little train track yeah. in yeah. Zurich. My buddy went to visit him, and it's all co- overgrown with weeds and stuff. Yeah. Like, he would throw out in the backyard, like, after he did, a, a like, a monster, an alien sculpture creature thing, you know, the plaster and the clay and everything would be cracking and breaking. He'd just put it out in his backyard and let rain get on it and let weeds crawl over over it and stuff because you know the mold was already built and you know the castings were being made and stuff but you know he just had this backyard like i was doing that too for a while i was throwing you know sculptures and castings and things that just you know because i was too busy to to properly dismantle them and put them in the garbage and stuff you know well and and so getting back to what we're going to be doing next, uh, the next two letters we've got G is for Grim Tales, and oh. so that uh, it's basically an interview with um, Tim Burton talking about oh. fairy tales. So it's it's hard to pick. It's hard to do. You know, based on that A chapter film. of the book, yeah. Uh, they they talked a lot about Edward Scissorhands. So I would ah. say we could probably do that. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah, yeah I haven't. Vincent God, Price man, film. I haven't seen that movie since probably the nineties. Wow. Yeah, it's a great one. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So we could. Yeah. And, and, and Vincent then, Price. I mean, ugh, I love Vincent Price. Oh Vincent yeah, Price. yeah, that's great. They also talk about the wonderful world of the Brothers Grimm from 1962. Yeah, which might we, which might be hard to find. That may be hard for us no, to track it's, down. It's not hard to find. It's not mm. at all. It's so, a stop motion film, and uh, Kerwin Matthews from Seventh Voyage of Sinbad stars in it. That's well, right. Yeah. If, if we can, if we can get it, would you rather do that or or Edward Scissorhands? Eh, it's up to you guys. You know, think about it. Or we could do sure. both. Yeah, we could do both. I mean, take a look at them. You know, go online and and see what you see from them and think about it. And let, yeah. let me know. I'm I'm up for both because I love stop motion animation. And you know, what's odd about the Brothers Grimm is that there's two versions. There's a musical and a non musical version. And people like Buddy Hackett, the crazy comedian Buddy Hackett, is in that film. Wow. And the same actor who played the villain in Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. You know, uh, you know the the guy who plays. Uh, Sukura, you know the the evil magician. He's yes. the same evil magician in Brothers Grimm. Oh. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. And cool. We'll definitely two headed giant in stop yeah. motion puppet. Two headed giant. Well, and then uh, the next letter is H is for Harlequinade, which is like um, clown movies, evil clown yeah. movies. Oh. We got to watch that laugh clown laugh with uh, Lon Chaney. That's probably a good oh, idea. Yeah. You know, I, I was toying. Silent? I was toying with silent? the idea of it. But it's too long, right? I mean, we can't do oh, audio yeah. commentary for that. What about the original, the television version with Tim Burton? Well, Tim that's Curry? that's a that's a mini series. That's right. Yeah. yeah that's right. So I we would be we would be killing ourselves doing that one. I think it's I think it's like two chapters of of like maybe four hours. Well, and, and there's like a that. new version of the movie, which I would give me an right. excuse two to watch it. Of that too, yeah, right? it would give me an excuse to watch it because I've never seen those. Uh, but you know uh, what we could consider though is killer clowns <laughs> from outer space. Oh God. <laughs> I do have that in DVD. So. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah. I've seen that's it. That's a fun one. Yeah. That's a fun that would be a fun one. That's a, that's, that's a actually, yeah. that's actually a good, a good I suggestion. Do. Yeah. Well, let's, 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 Go Let's into a uh, G first. Uh, yeah. uh, do that, and then we have plenty of time to watch more movies yeah. for uh, letter H. But sure. yeah, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. That's yeah. Brothers Kyoto. Is that it? Yes, that's correct. And recently they did. You know how they did for Hellraiser. You know, two. They had the Zoom meeting with everybody participating. Yeah, they did that for Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I guess oh. it was like an anniversary, oh, that's maybe fortieth cool. or something like that. And so I think my friend, you know, Ralph Miller, the same guy that was helping me with information about From Beyond, he was working on Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And so he told me about that Zoom, you know, meeting of all of them watching it together. And you know, like the Chota brothers are there, and the actors. Oh, are there. that must have been really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So Definitely we'll find that if we that. can get the link to that and send that to you if you want to check it out. And then we got something different, right? Yeah, uh, right? yeah. So the 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 publisher of a of, a, of an RPG called uh, Cult Divinity Lost. Oh yeah, uh, approached I, I us to the episode where you guys yeah. talked about that. Yeah, so they approached us to to, to uh, review their their role playing game, and I said, "Well, I think the best way to review it is to play it." And I said, "Can you DM it for us, and we'll and we'll play it on video?" And we'll, so, did we'll, you find another person to participate? Um, 
I not we're going to open it up to the to the fandom or to see if somebody wanted to help. Yeah, out yeah I think we're still working on that. I mean, we've got okay. we we've got three of us now. Oh, great! Yeah, and so that that's going to be That'll coming be fun up soon, for you, Ryan, because you love gaming. Oh yeah, yeah. And, It'll be new for me because I've never <laughs> done any sort yeah. of Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> RPG thing. So I'm well, going to be the odd man. This will be this okay. will be kind of probably more more akin to the, from what I'm understanding. It'll be kind of similar to the Lovecraft game uh-huh right yeah horror horror yeah game. I, yeah i think so it's like there's a hidden world behind our world and the people who can see into it are the characters right. that you play like you said like from beyond kind of yeah yeah so we've got that and then uh abrat three we'll do an episode um with hopefully with peggy o'leary again and marcus uh to talk that's about awesome Aberrant three she's absolutely fantastic. Midnight. yeah she's her, great her episodes well you guys are doing great man keep it up well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us today. You and Nina, uh, you guys My really pleasure. added a lot. I'm so mm-hmm. glad you invited me to do Alien because I love Alien. It's, <laughs> I would have been so sad to find out <laughs> that you did it without me. <laughs> yeah. Big Alien fan. Yeah. I, All right, guys. Well, and, and you guys at home listening to this, thanks for joining us for another commentary track, uh, part of the series A through Z of Horror. And Ryan, would you like to do the outro? And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. And in space, no one can hear you scream. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com. We've got an archive of past episodes, news, features, and reviews, along with all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on every other place you can find podcasts. Share your thoughts with us and share our podcast with your friends. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that's not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.